The French Revolution, A History. By Thomas Carlyle. 1837. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. Volume 2. The Constitution. Book 2.I. The Feast of Pikes. Chapter 2.1.I. In the Tuileries. The victim having once got his stroke of grace, the catastrophe can be considered as almost come. There is small interest now in watching his long low moans, notable only are his sharper agonies, what convulsive struggles he may take to cast the torture off from him, and then finally the last departure of life itself, and how he lies extinct and ended either wrapped like Caesar in decorous mantle folds, or unseemly sunk together, like one that had not the force even to die. Was French royalty, when wrenched forth from its tapestries in that fashion, on that 6th of October 1789, such a victim? Universal France, and royal proclamation to all the provinces, answers anxiously, no. Nevertheless one may fear the worst. Royalty was beforehand so decrepit, moribund, there is little life in it to heal an injury. How much of its strength, which was of the imagination merely, has fled, rascality having looked plainly in the king's face, and not died. When the assembled crows can pluck up their scarecrow, and say to it, here shalt thou stand and not there, and can treat with it, and make it, from an infinite, a quite finite constitutional scarecrow, what is to be looked for? Not in the finite constitutional scarecrow, but in what still unmeasured, infinite seeming force may rally round it, is there thenceforth any hope? For it is most true that all available authority is mystic in its conditions, and comes by the grace of God. Cheerfuller than watching the death struggles of royalism will it be to watch the growth and gamblings of Sanskulatism, for, in human things, especially in human society, all death is but a death birth, thus if the scepter is departing from Louis, it is only that, in other forms, other scepters, or even pike scepters, may bear sway. In a prurient element, rich with nutritive influences, we shall find that Sanskulatism grows lustily, and even frisks in not ungraceful sport, as indeed most young creatures are sportful. Nay, may it not be noted further, that as the grown cat, and cat species generally, is the cruelest thing known so the merriest is precisely the kitten, or growing cat? But fancy the royal family risen from its truckle beds on the morrow of that mad day, fancy the municipal inquiry, how would your majesty please to lodge question mark and then that the king's rough answer, each may lodge as he can, I am well enough, is congeed and bowed away, in expressive grins, by the town hall functionaries, with obsequious upholsterers at their back, and how the chateau of the Tuileries is repainted, regarnished into a golden royal residence, and Lafayette with his blue national guards lies encompassing it, as blue Neptune, in the language of poets, does an island, wooingly. Thither may the wrecks of rehabilitated loyalty gather, if it will become constitutional, for constitutionalism thinks no evil, since Gulotism itself rejoices in the king's countenance. The rubbish of a monadic insurrection, as in this ever-kindly world all rubbish can and must be, is swept aside, and so again, on clear arena, under new conditions, with something even of a new stateliness, we begin a new course of action. Arthur Young has witnessed the strangest scene, Majesty walking unattended in the Tuileries Gardens, and miscellaneous tricolor crowds, who cheer it, and reverently make way for it, the very Queen commands at lowest respectful silence, regretful avoidance. Simple ducks, in those royal waters, quackle for crumbs from young royal fingers, the little dolphin has a little railed garden, where he is seen delving, with ruddy cheeks and flaxen curled hair, also a little hutch to put his tools in, and screen himself against showers. What peaceable simplicity! Is it peace of a father restored to his children? Or of a taskmaster who has lost his whip? Lafayette and the municipality in universal constitutionalism assert the former, and do what is in them to realize it. Such patriotism as snarls dangerously, and shows teeth, patrolitism shall suppress, or far better, royalty shall soothe down the angry hair of it, by gentle paddings, and, most effectual of all, by fuller diet. Yes, not only shall Paris be fed, but the king's hand be seen in that work. The household goods of the poor shall, up to a certain amount, by royal bounty, be disengaged from pawn, and that insatiable Montepiete disgorge, rides in the city with their vive la roi need not fail, and so by substance and show, shall royalty, if man's art can popularize it, be popularized. Or, alas, is it neither restored father nor diswhip taskmaster that walks there, but an anomalous complex of both these, and of innumerable other heterogeneities, reducible to no rubric, if not to this newly devised one, King Louis Restorer of French Liberty? Man indeed, and King Louis like other men, lives in this world to make rule out of the ruleless, by his living energy he shall force the absurd itself to become less absurd. But then if there be no living energy, living passivity only? King Serpent, hurled into his unexpected watery dominion, 
did at least bite, and assert credibly that he was there, but as for the poor King Log, tumbled hither and thither as thousandfold chance and other will than his might direct, how happy for him that he was indeed wooden, and, doing nothing, could also see and suffer nothing. It is a distracted business. For his French Majesty, meanwhile, one of the worst things is that he can get no hunting. Alas, no hunting henceforth, only a fatal being hunted. Scarcely, in the next June weeks, shall he taste again the joys of the game destroyer, in next June, and never more. He sends for his smith tools, gives, in the course of the day, official or ceremonial business being ended, a few strokes of the file, calc coups de lime. Innocent brother mortal, why wert thou not an obscure substantial maker of locks, but doomed in that other far-seen craft, to be a maker only of world follies, unrealities, things self-destructive, which no mortal hammering could rivet into coherence. Poor Louis is not without insight, nor even without the elements of will, some sharpness of temper, spurting at times from a stagnating character. If harmless inertness could save him, it were well, but he will slumber and painfully dream, and to do aught is not given him. Royalist antiquarians still show the rooms where majesty and sweet, in these extraordinary circumstances, had their lodging. Here sat the queen, reading, for she had her library brought hither, though the king refused his, taking vehement counsel of the vehement uncounseled, sorrowing over altered times, yet with sure hope of better, in her young rosy boy, has she not the living emblem of hope? It is a murky, working sky, yet with golden gleams, of dawn, or of deeper meteoric night. Here again this chamber, on the other side of the main entrance, was the king's, here his majesty breakfasted, and did official work, here daily after breakfast he received the queen, sometimes in pathetic friendliness, sometimes in human sulkiness, for flesh is weak, and, when questioned about business would answer, Madam, your business is with the children. Nay, sire, were it not better you, your majesty's self, took the children? So asks impartial history, scornful that the thicker vessel was not also the stronger, pity struck for the porcelain clay of humanity rather than for the tile clay, though indeed both were broken. So, however, in this Medicean Tuileries, shall the French king and queen now sit, for one and forty months, and see a wild fermenting France work out its own destiny, and theirs. Months bleak, ungenial, of rapid vicissitude, yet with a mild pale splendor, here and there, as of an April that were leading to leafiest summer, as of an October that led only to everlasting frost. Medicean Tuileries, how changed since it was a peaceful tile field. Or is the ground itself fate stricken, accursed, an atrius palace, for that Louvre window is still nigh, out of which a cape, whipped of the furies, fired his signal of the Saint Bartholomew. Dark is the way of the eternal as mirrored in this world of time, God's way is in the sea, and his path in the great deep. Chapter 2.12. In the Salle de Menage. To believing patriots, however, it is now clear, that the Constitution will march, Marcher had at once legs to stand on. Quick, then, ye patriots, bestir yourselves, and make it, shape legs for it. In the Archiviche, or Archbishop's Palace, his grace himself having fled, and afterwards in the riding hall, named Menage, close on the Tuileries, there does a national assembly apply itself to the miraculous work. Successfully, had there been any heaven-scaling Prometheus among them, not successfully since there was none. There, in noisy debate, for the sessions are occasionally scandalous, and as many as three speakers have been seen in the tribune at once, let us continue to fancy it wearing the slow months. Tough, dogmatic, long of wind is Abbe Mori, Ciceronian pathetic is Cazales. Keen trenchant, on the other side, glitters a young Barnav, abhorrent of sophistry, shearing, like keen Damascus sabre, all sophistry asunder, reckless what else he shear with it. Simple seemest thou, O solid Dutch built Petion, if solid, surely dull. Nor life-giving in that tone of thine, livelier polemical rabout. With ineffable serenity sniffs great sea eyes, aloft, alone, his constitution ye may babble over, ye may mar, but can by no possibility mend, is not polity a science he has exhausted. Cool, slow, two military lammoths are visible, with their quality sneer, or demi sneer, they shall gallantly refund their mother's pension, when the red book is produced, gallantly be wounded in duels. A Marquis to Longin, whose pen we yet thank, sits there, in stoical meditative humour, often is silent, accepts what destiny will send. Thorat and parliamentary Dupour produce mountains of reformed law, liberal, anglomaniac, available and unavailable. Mortals rise and fall. Shall Goose Gobel, for example, or go with an umlaut bell, for he is of Strasbourg German breed, be a constitutional archbishop? Alone of all men there, Mirabeau may begin to discern clearly whither all this is tending. Patriotism, accordingly, regrets that his zeal seems to be getting cool. 
in that famed Pentecost night of the 4th of August, when new faith rose suddenly into miraculous fire, and old feudality was burnt up, men remarked that Mirabeau took no hand in it, that, in fact, he luckily happened to be absent. But did he not defend the veto, ne veto absolu, and tell vehement Barna that 600 irresponsible senators would make of all tyrannies the insupportablest? Again, how anxious was he that the king's ministers should have seat and voice in the National Assembly, doubtless with an eye to being minister himself. Whereupon the National Assembly decides, what is very momentous, that no deputy shall be minister, he, in his haughty stormful manner, advising us to make it, no deputy called Mirabeau. A man of perhaps inveterate feudalisms, of stratagems, too often visible leanings towards the royalist side, a man suspect, whom patriotism will unmask. Thus, in these June days, when the question who shall have right to declare war comes on, you hear horse hawker sound dolefully through the streets, grand treason of Count Mirabeau, price only one sous semicolon because he pleads that it shall be not the assembly but the king. Pleads, nay prevails, for in spite of the horse hawkers, and an endless populace raised by them to the pitch even of Lanterne, he mounts the tribune next day, grim resolute, murmuring aside to his friends that speak of danger, I know it, I must come hence either in triumph, or else torn in fragments, and it was in triumph that he came. A man of stout heart, whose popularity is not of the populace, pa populace here, whom no clamour of unwashed mobs without doors, or of washed mobs within, can scarce from his way. Dumont remembers hearing him deliver a report on Marseille, every word was interrupted on the part of the Côté d'Oie by abusive epithets, calumniator, liar, assassin, scoundrel, celerat, Mirabeau pauses a moment, and, in a honeyed tone, addressing the most furious, says, I wait, messieurs, till these amenities be exhausted. A man enigmatic, difficult to unmask. For example, whence comes his money? Can the profit of a newspaper, sorely eaten into by Dame Leger, can this, and the 18 francs a day your national deputy has, be supposed equal to this expenditure? House in the Chaussee d'Anton, country house at Argentoy, splendors, sumptuosities, orgies, living as if he had a mint. All saloons barred against adventurer Mirabeau, are flung wide open to King Mirabeau, the cynosure of Europe, whom female France flutters to behold, though the man Mirabeau is one and the same. As for money, one may conjecture that royalism furnishes it, which if royalism do, will not the same be welcome, as money always is to him. Sold, whatever patriotism thinks, he cannot readily be, the spiritual fire which is in that man, which shining through such confusions is nevertheless conviction, and makes him strong, and without which he had no strength, is not viable nor saleable in such transference of barter, it would vanish and not be. Perhaps paid and not sold, pay a pas vendu, as poor Riverol, in the unhappier converse way, calls himself sold and not paid. A man travelling, comet-like, in splendour and nebulosity, his wild way, whom telescopic patriotism may long watch, but, without higher mathematics, will not make out. A questionable most blamable man, yet to us the far notablest of all. With rich munificence, as we often say, in a most blinkered, bespectacled, logic-chopping generation, nature has gifted this man with an eye. Welcome is his word, there where he speaks and works, and growing ever welcomer, for it alone goes to the heart of the business, logical cobwebbery shrinks itself together, and thou seest a thing, how it is, how is may be worked with. Unhappily our National Assembly has much to do, of France to regenerate, and France is short of so many requisites, short even of cash. These same finances give trouble enough, no choking of the deficit, which gapes ever, give, give. To appease the deficit we venture on a hazardous step, sale of the clergy's lands and superfluous edifices, most hazardous. Nay, given the sale, who is to buy them, ready money having fled? Wherefore, on the 19th day of December, a paper money of assignats, of bonds secured, or assigned, on that clerico-national property, and unquestionable at least in payment of that, is decreed, the first of a long series of like financial performances, which shall astonish mankind. So that now, while old rags last, there shall be no lack of circulating medium, whether of commodities to circulate thereon is another question. But, after all, does not this assignate business speak volumes for modern science? Bankruptcy, we may say, was come, as the end of all delusions needs must come, yet how gently, in softening diffusion, in mild succession, was it hereby made to fall, like no all-destroying avalanche, like gentle showers of a powdery impalpable snow, shower after shower, till all was indeed buried, and yet little was destroyed that could not be replaced, be dispensed with. To such length as modern machinery reached. Bankruptcy, we said, was great, but indeed money itself is a standing miracle. 
On the whole, it is a matter of endless difficulty, that of the clergy. Clerical property may be made the nations, and the clergy hired servants of the state, but if so, is it not an altered church? Adjustment enough, of the most confused sort, has become unavoidable. Old landmarks, in any sense, avail not in a new France. Nay literally, the very ground is new divided, your old party-colored provinces become new uniform departments, 83 in number, whereby, as in some sudden shifting of the earth's axis, no mortal knows his new latitude at once. The twelve old Parlement too, what is to be done with them? The old Parlement are declared to be all in permanent vacation, till once the new equal justice, of departmental courts, national appeal court, of elective justices, justices of peace, and other thorough and dupour apparatus be got ready. They have to sit there, these old Parlement uneasily waiting, as it were, with the rope round their neck, crying as they can, is there none to deliver us? But happily the answer being, none, none, they are a manageable class, these Parlement. They can be bullied, even into silence, the Paris Parliament, wiser than most, has never whimpered. They will and must sit there, in such vacation as is fit, their chamber of vacation distributes in the interim what little justice is going. With the rope round their neck, their destiny may be succinct. On the 13th of November 1790, Mayor Bailly shall walk to the Palais de Justice, few even heeding him, and with municipal seal stamp and a little hot wax, seal up the parliamentary paper rooms, and the dread Parlement of Paris pass away, into chaos, gently as does a dream. So shall the Parlement perish, succinctly, and innumerable eyes be dry. Not so the clergy. For granting even that religion were dead, that it had died, half centuries ago, with unutterable Dubois, or emigrated lately, to Alsace, with necklace Cardinal Rohan, or that it now walked as goblin revenant with Bishop Talleyrand of Auden, yet does not the shadow of religion, the cant of religion, still linger? The clergy have means and material, means, of number, organization, social weight, a material, at lowest, of public ignorance, known to be the mother of devotion. Nay, with all, is it incredible that there might, in simple hearts, latent here and there like gold grains in the mud beach, still dwell some real faith in God, of so singular and tenacious a sort that even a Mori or a Talleyrand, could still be the symbol for it. Enough, and clergy has strength, the clergy has craft and indignation. It is a most fatal business this of the clergy. A waltering hydrocoil, which the National Assembly has stirred up about its ears, hissing, stinging, which cannot be appeased, alive, which cannot be trampled dead. Fatal, from first to last. Scarcely after fifteen months debating, can a civil constitution of the clergy be so much as got to paper, and then forgetting it into reality? Alas, such civil constitution is but an agreement to disagree. It divides France from end to end, with a new split infinitely complicating all the other splits. Catholicism, what of it there is left, with the cant of Catholicism, raging on the one side, and skeptic heathenism on the other, both, by contradiction, waxing fanatic. What endless jarring, of refractory hated priests, and constitutional despised ones, of tender consciences, like the king's, and consciences hot-seared, like certain of his peoples, the whole to end in feasts of reason in a war of La Vendée. So deep-seated is religion in the heart of man, and holds of all infinite passions. If the dead echo of it still did so much, what could not the living voice of it once do? Finance and constitution, law and gospel, this surely were work enough, yet this is not all. In fact, the ministry, and Necker himself whom a brass inscription fastened by the people over his door little testifies to be the ministre adore, are dwindling into clearer and clearer nullity. Execution or legislation, arrangement or detail, from their nerveless fingers all drops undone, all lights at last on the toiled shoulders of an august representative body. Heavy-laden National Assembly. It has to hear of innumerable fresh revolts, brigand expeditions, of shadows in the West, especially of charter chests, chartiers, set on fire for there too the overloaded ass frightfully recalcitrates. Of cities in the south full of heats and jealousies, which will end in crossed sabres, Marseille against Toulon, and Carpentras beleaguered by Avignon, such royalist collision in a career of freedom, nay patriot collision, which a mere difference of velocity will bring about. Of a Jordan Coutete, who has skulked thitherward, from the claws of the Châtelet, and will raise whole scoundrel regiments. Also it has to hear of royalist camp of Jalas, Jalas mountain girdled plain, amid the rocks of the Cévennes, whence royalism, as is feared and hoped, may dash down like a mountain deluge, and submerge France. A singular thing this camp of Jalas, existing mostly on paper. For the soldiers at Jalas, being peasants or national guards, were in heart-sworn sansculottes, and all that the royalist captains could do was, with false words, 
to keep them, or rather keep the report of them, drawn up there, visible to all imaginations, for a terror and a sign, if peradventure France might be reconquered by theatrical machinery, by the picture of a royalist army done to the life. Not till the third summer was this portent, burning out by fits and then fading, got finally extinguished, was the old castle of Jalas, no camp being visible to the bodily eye, got blown asunder by some national guards. Also it has to hear not only of Brissot and his friends of the blacks, but by and by of a whole Saint Domingo blazing skyward, blazing in literal fire, and in far worse metaphorical, beaconing the nightly main. Also of the shipping interest, and the landed interest, and all manner of interests, reduced to distress. Of industry everywhere manacled, bewildered, and only rebellion thriving. Of sub-officers, soldiers and sailors in mutiny by land and water. Of soldiers, at Nancy, as we shall see, needing to be cannonaded by a brave buoy. Of sailors, nay the very galley slaves, at Brest, needing also to be cannonaded, but with no buoy to do it. For indeed, to say it in a word, in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Such things has an August National Assembly to hear of, as it goes on regenerating France. Sad and stern, but what remedy? Get the constitution ready, and all men will swear to it, for do not addresses of adhesion arrive by the cartload? In this manner, by heaven's blessing, and a constitution got ready, shall the bottomless fire gulf be vaulted in, with rag paper, and order will wed freedom, and live with her there, till it grow too hot for them. O Cote Gauche, worthy are ye, as the adhesive addresses generally say, to fix the regards of the universe, the regards of this one poor planet, at lowest. Nay, it must be owned, the Cote d'Oie makes a still matter figure. An irrational generation, irrational, imbecile, and with the vehement obstinacy characteristic of that, a generation which will not learn. Falling Bastilles, insurrections of women, thousands of smoking manor houses, a country bristling with no crop but that of sansculotic steel, these were tolerably didactic lessons, but then they have not taught. There are still men, of whom it was of old written, bray them in a mortar. Or, in milder language, they have wetted their delusions, fire nor steel, nor any sharpness of experience, shall sever the bond, till death do us part. Of such may the heavens have mercy, for the earth, with her rigorous necessity, will have none. Admit, at the same time, that it was most natural. Man lives by hope, Pandora when her box of God's gifts flew all out and became God's curses, still retained hope. How shall an irrational mortal, when his high place is never so evidently pulled down, and he, being irrational, is left resourceless, part with the belief that it will be rebuilt? It would make all so straight again, it seems so unspeakably desirable, so reasonable, would you but look at it aright? For, must not the thing which was continue to be, or else the solid world dissolve. Yes, persist, O oh infatuated sanscalots of France. Revolt against constituted authorities, hunt out your rightful seigneurs, who at bottom so loved you, and readily shed their blood for you, in countries' battles as at Rossbach and elsewhere, and even in preserving game, were preserving you, could ye but have understood it, hunt them out, as if they were wild wolves, set fire to their shadows and chartiers as to wolf dens, and what then? Why, then turn every man his hand against his fellow. In confusion, famine, desolation, regret the days that are gone, rueful recall them, recall us with them. To repentant prayers we will not be deaf. So, with dimmer or clearer consciousness, must the right side reason and act. An inevitable position perhaps, but a most false one for them. Evil, be thou our good, this henceforth must virtually be their prayer. The fiercer the effervescence grows, the sooner will it pass, for after all it is but some mad effervescence, the world is solid and cannot dissolve. For the rest, if they have any positive industry, it is that of plots and backstairs conclaves. Plots which cannot be executed, which are mostly theoretic on their part, for which nevertheless this and the other practical Sir Ojar, Sir Mailboy, Sir Bon Saverdin, gets into trouble, gets imprisoned, and escapes with difficulty. Nay there is a poor practical Chevalier Favors who, not without some passing reflex on Monsieur himself, gets hanged for them, amid loud uproar of the world. Poor favor is, he keeps dictating his last will at the Hotel de Ville, through the whole remainder of the day, a weary February day, offers to reveal secrets, if they will save him, handsomely declines since they will not, then dies, in the flare of torchlight, with politest composure, remarking, rather than exclaiming, with outspread hands, people, I die innocent, pray for me. Poor favor is, type of so much that has prowled indefatigable over France, in days now ending, and, in freer field, might have earned instead of prowling, to thee it is no theory. In the Senate House again, the attitude of the right side is that of calm unbelief. 
Let an August National Assembly make a 4th of August abolition of feudality, declare the clergy state servants who shall have wages, vote suspensive vetoes, new law courts, vote or decree what contested thing it will, have it responded to from the four corners of France, nay get king's sanction, and what other acceptance were conceivable. The right side, as we find, persists, with imperturbableist tenacity, in considering, and ever and anon shows that it still considers, all these so-called decrees as mere temporary whims, which indeed stand on paper, but in practice and fact are not, and cannot be. Figure the brass head of an Abbe Mori flooding forth Jesuitic eloquence in this strain, dusky de Spraminal, Beryl Mirabeau, probably in liquor, and enough of others, cheering him from the right, and, for example, with what visage a sea green robes pure eyes him from the left. And how sea eyes ineffably sniffs on him, or does not deign to sniff, and how the galleries groan in spirit, or bark rabbit on him, so that to escape the lanterne, on stepping forth, he needs presence of mind, and a pair of pistols in his girdle. For he is one of the toughest of men. Here indeed becomes notable one great difference between our two kinds of civil war, between the modern lingual or parliamentary logical kind, and the ancient, or manual kind, in the steel battlefield, much to the disadvantage of the former. In the manual kind, where you front your foe with drawn weapon, one right stroke is final, for, physically speaking, when the brains are out the man does honestly die, and trouble you no more. But how different when it is with arguments you fight. Here no victory yet definable can be considered as final. Beat him down, with parliamentary invective, till sense be fled, cut him in two, hanging one half in this dilemma horn, the other on that, blow the brains or thinking faculty quite out of him for the time, it skills not, he rallies and revives on the morrow, tomorrow he repairs his golden fires. The thing that will logically extinguish him is perhaps still a desideratum in constitutional civilization. For how, till a man know, in some measure, at what point he becomes logically defunct, can parliamentary business be carried on, and talk cease or slake? Doubtless it was some feeling of this difficulty, and the clear insight how little such knowledge yet existed in the French nation, new in the constitutional career, and how defunct aristocrats would continue to walk for unlimited periods, as Partridge the Alamanac maker did, that had sunk into the deep mind of people's friend Marat, an eminently practical mind, and had grown there, in that richest putrescent soil, into the most original plan of action ever submitted to a people. Not yet has it grown, but it has germinated, it is growing, rooting itself into Tartarus, branching towards heaven, the second season hence, we shall see it risen out of the bottomless darkness, full-grown, into disastrous twilight, a hemlock tree, great as the world, on or under whose boughs all the people's friends of the world may lodge. 260,000 aristocrat heads, that is the precisest calculation, though one would not stand on a few hundreds, yet we never rise as high as the round 300,000. Shudder at it, O people, but it is as true as that ye yourselves, and your people's friend, are alive. These prating senators of yours hover ineffectual on the barren letter, and will never save the revolution. A Cassandra Marat cannot do it, with his single shrunk arm, but with a few determined men it were possible. Give me, said the people's friend, in his cold way, when young Barbaru, once his pupil in a course of what was called optics, went to see him, give me two hundred Naples bravos, armed each with a good dirk, and a muff on his left arm by way of shield, with them I will traverse France, and accomplish the revolution. Nay, be brave, young Barbaru, for thou seest, there is no jesting in those roomy eyes, in that soot-bleared figure, most earnest of created things, neither indeed is there madness, of the straight waistcoat sort. Such produce shall the time ripen in cavernous Marat, the man forbid, living in Paris cellars, lone as fanatic anchorite in his Thebade, say, as far-seen Simon on his pillar, taking peculiar views therefrom. Patriots may smile, and, using him as bandog now to be muzzled, now to be let bark, name him, as de Moulin does, maximum of patriotism and Cassandra Marat, but were it not singular if this dirk and muff plan of his, with superficial modifications, proved to be precisely the plan adopted? After this manner, in these circumstances, do August senators regenerate France. Nay, they are, in very deed, believed to be regenerating it, on account of which great fact, main fact of their history, the wearied I can never be permitted wholly to ignore them. But, looking away now from these precincts of the Tuileries, where constitutional royalty, let Lafayette water it as he will, languishes too like a cut branch, and August senators are perhaps at bottom only perfecting their theory of defective verbs, how does the young reality, young Sanskaladism thrive? The attentive observer can answer, it thrives bravely, putting forth new buds, expanding the old buds into leaves, into boughs. Is not French existence, as before, most prurient, all loosened, most nutrient for it? Sanskulatism has the property of growing by what other things die of, 
by agitation, contention, disarrangement, nay in a word, by what is the symbol and fruit of all these, hunger. In such a France as this, hunger, as we have remarked, can hardly fail. The provinces, the southern cities feel it in their turn, and what it brings, exasperation, preternatural suspicion. In Paris some halcyon days of abundance followed the monadic insurrection, with its Versailles grain carts, and recovered restorer of liberty, but they could not continue. The month is still October when famishing Saint Antoine, in a moment of passion, seizes a poor baker, innocent Francois the baker, and hangs him, in Constantinople wise, but even this, singular as it might seem, does not cheapen bread. Too clear it is, no royal bounty, no municipal dexterity can adequately feed a Bastille destroying Paris. Wherefore, on view of the hangbaker, constitutionalism in sorrow and anger demands Loi Martial, a kind of riot act, and indeed gets it, most readily, almost before the sun goes down. This is that famed martial law, with its red flag, its drapeau rouge, in virtue of which Mayor Bailly, or any mayor, has but henceforth to hang out that new oriflame of his, then to read or mumble something about the king's peace, and, after certain pauses, serve any undispersing assemblage with musket shot, or whatever shot will disperse it. A decisive law, and most just on one proviso, that all patrolitism be of God, and all mob assembling be of the devil, otherwise not so just. May or by ye be unwilling to use it. Hang not out that new or riflame, flame not of gold but of the one of gold. The thrice blessed revolution is done, thou thinkest? If so it will be well with thee. But now let no mortal say henceforth that an August National Assembly wants riot, all it ever wanted was riot enough to balance court plotting, all it now wants, of heaven or of earth, is to get its theory of defective verbs perfected. Chapter 2.13. The Muster. With famine and a constitutional theory of defective verbs going on, all other excitement is conceivable. A universal shaking and sifting of French existence this is, in the course of which, for one thing, what a multitude of low-lying figures are sifted to the top, and set busily to work there. Dogleach Murat, now foreseen as Simon Stylites, we already know, him and others, raised aloft. The mere sample, these, of what is coming, of what continues coming, upwards from the realm of night. Chomet, by and by Anaxagoras Chomet, one already descries, mellifluous in street groups, not now a sea boy on the high and giddy mast, a mellifluous tribune of the common people, with long curling locks, on born stone of the thoroughfares, able subeditor too, who shall rise, to the very gallows. Clerk Talion, he also has become subeditor, shall become able editor, and more. Bibliopolic Mamoro, typographic pro see new trades opening. Kalu Derboy, tearing a passion to rags, pauses on the thespian boards, listens, with that black bushy head, to the sound of the world's drama, shall the mimetic become real? Did ye hiss him, O men of lions? Better had ye clapped. Happy now, indeed, for all manner of mimetic, half-original men. Tumid blustering, with more or less of sincerity, which need not be entirely sincere, yet the sincerer the better, is like to go far. Shall we say, the revolution element works itself rarer and rarer, so that only lighter and lighter bodies will float in it till at last the mere blown bladder is your only swimmer? Limitation of mind, then vehemence, promptitude, audacity, shall all be available, to which add only these two, cunning and good lungs. Good fortune must be presupposed. Accordingly, of all classes the rising one, we observe, is now the attorney class, witness Beziers, carriers, Fakay Tinvilles, Bazoche Captain Bourdon more than enough. Such figures shall night, from her wonder-bearing bosom, emit, swarm after swarm of another deeper and deepest swarm not yet dawned on the astonished eye, of pilfering candle snuffers, thief allays, disfrock capuchins, and so many Hebert's, Henriot's, Ronson's, Rossignol's, let us, as long as possible, forbear speaking. Thus, over France, all stirs that has what the physiologists call irritability in it, how much more all wherein irritability has perfected itself into vitality, into actual vision, and force that can will. All stirs, and if not in Paris, flocks thither. Great and greater waxes President Dannon in his Cordelier section, his rhetorical tropes are all gigantic, energy flashes from his black brows, menaces in his athletic figure, rolls in the sound of his voice reverberating from the domes, this man also, like Mirabeau, has a natural eye, and begins to see whither constitutionalism is tending, though with a wish in it different from Mirabeau's. Remark, on the other hand, how General Dumouriez has quitted Normandy in the Cherbourg breakwater, to come, whither we may guess. It is his second or even third trial at Paris, since this new era began, but now it is in right earnest, for he has quitted all else. Wiry, elastic unwearied man, 
whose life was but a battle and a march. No, not a creature of Choiseul's, the creature of God and of my sword, comma, he fiercely answered in old days. Overfalling Corsican batteries, in the deadly fire hail, wriggling invincible from under his horse, at Clostier camp of the Netherlands, though tethered with crushed stirrup iron and nineteen wounds, tough, minatory, standing at bay, as forlorn hope, on the skirts of Poland, intriguing, battling in cabinet and field, roaming far out, obscure, as king's spile, or sitting sealed up, enchanted in Bastille, fencing, pamphleteering, scheming and struggling from the very birth of him, the man has come thus far. How repressed, how irrepressible! Like some incarnate spirit in prison, which indeed he was, hewing on granite walls for deliverance, striking fire flashes from them. And now has the general earthquake rent his cavern too? Twenty years younger, what might he not have done? But his hair has a shade of grey, his way of thought is all fixed, military. He can grow no further, and the new world is in such growth. We will name him, on the whole, one of heaven's Swiss, without faith, wanting above all things work, work on any side. Work also is appointed him, and he will do it. Not from over France only are the unrestful flocking towards Paris, but from all sides of Europe. Where the carcass is, thither will the eagles gather. Think how many a Spanish Guzman, Martinico Fournier named Fournier American, engineer Miranda from the very Andes, were flocking or had flocked. Walloon Pereira might boast of the strangest parentage, him, they say, Prince Countess the diplomatist heedlessly dropped, like ostrich egg, to be hatched of chance, into an ostrich eater. Jewish or German phrase do business in the great cesspool of Agio, which cesspool this assignat fiat has quickened, into a mother of dead dogs. Swiss Clavier could found no so Sinian Genovese colony in Ireland, but he paused, years ago, prophetic before the minister's hotel at Paris, and said, it was born on his mind that he one day was to be minister, and laughed. Swiss pitch, on the other hand, sits sleek-headed, frugal, the wonder of his own alley, and even of neighbouring ones, for humility of mind, and a thought deeper than most men's, sit there, tartuf, till wanted. Ye Italian do fornies, Flemish prolies, flit hither all ye bipeds of prey. Come whosoever head is hot, thou of mind ungoverned, be it chaos as of undevelopment or chaos as of ruin, the man who cannot get known, the man who is too well known, if thou have any vendable faculty, nay if thou have but audacity and loquacity, come. They come, with hot unutterabilities in their heart, as pilgrims towards a miraculous shrine. Nay how many come as vacant strollers, aimless, of whom Europe is full merely towards something. For benighted fowls, when you beat their bushes, rush towards any light. Thus Frederick Baron Trank too is here, mazed, purblind, from the cells of Magdeburg, Minotauric cells, and his Ariadne lost. Singular to say, Trank, in these years, sells wine, not indeed in bottle, but in wood. Nor is our England without her missionaries. She has her life-saving Needham, to whom was solemnly presented a civic sword, long since rusted into nothingness. Her pain, rebellious staymaker, unkempt, who feels that he, a single needleman, did by his common-sense pamphlet, free America, that he can and will free all this world, perhaps even the other. Price Stanhope Constitutional Association sends over to congratulate, welcomed by National Assembly, though they are but a London club, whom Burke and Toryism I askance. On thee too, for country's sake, O Chevalier John Paul, be a word spent, or misspent. In faded naval uniform, Paul Jones lingers visible here, like a wineskin from which the wine is all drawn. Like the ghost of himself. Lois is once loud brute, scarcely audible, safe, with extreme tedium in ministerial antechambers, in this or the other charitable dining room, mindful of the past. What changes, culminatings and declinings? Not now, poor Paul, thou lookest wistful over the Solway brine, by the foot of native Criffel, into blue mountainous Cumberland, into blue infinitude, environed with thrift, with humble friendliness, thyself, young fool, longing to be aloft from it, or even to be away from it. Yes, beyond that sapphire promontory, which men name St. Bees, which is not sapphire either, but dull sandstone, when one gets close to it, there is a world. Which world thou too shalt taste of. From yonder white haven rises smoke clouds, ominous though ineffectual. Proud forth quakes at his bellying sails, had not the wind suddenly shifted. Flamborough reapers, homegoing, pause on the hillside, for what sulphur cloud is that that defaces the sleek sea, sulphur cloud spitting streaks of fire? A sea cockfight it is, and of the hottest, where British Serapis and French-American Bonhomme Richard do lash and throttle each other, in their fashion, and lo the desperate valour has suffocated the deliberate, and Paul Jones too is of the kings of the sea. The Euxin, the Mutian waters felt thee next, and long-skirted Turks, O Paul, and thy fiery soul has wasted itself in thousand contradictions, 
to no purpose. 4. In far lands, with scarlet Nassau siegeants, with sinful imperial Catherines, is not the heart broken, even as at home with the mean? Poor Paul. Hunger and dispiritment track thy sinking footsteps, once or at most twice, in this revolution tumult the figure of the emerges, mute, ghost-like, as with stars dim twinkling through. And then, when the light is gone quite out, a national legislature grants ceremonial funeral. As good had been the natural Presbyterian Kirk Bell, and six feet of Scottish earth, among the dust of thy loved ones, such world lay beyond the promontory of St. Bees. Such is the life of sinful mankind here below. But of all strangers, far the notablest for us is Baron Jean Baptiste de Clutes, or, dropping baptisms and feudalisms, world citizen Anacarsis Clutes, from Cleves. Him mark, judicious reader. Thou hast known his uncle, sharp sighted thoroughgoing Cornelius de Pau, who mercilessly cuts down cherished illusions, and of the finest antique Spartans, will make mere modern cutthroat maynots. The like stuff is an anacarsis, hot metal, full of scoriae, which should and could have been smelted out, but which will not. He has wandered over this terraqueous planet, seeking, one may say, the paradise we lost long ago. He has seen English Burke, has been seen of the Portugal Inquisition, has roamed, and fought, and written, is writing, among other things, evidences of the Mohammedan religion. But now, like his Scythian adoptive godfather, he finds himself in the Paris Athens, surely, at last, the haven of his soul. A dashing man, beloved at patriotic dinner tables, with gaiety, nay with humor, headlong, trenchant, a free purse, in suitable costume, though what mortal ever more despised costumes? Under all costumes Anacarsis seeks the man, not stylites morale will more freely trample costumes, if they hold no man. This is the faith of Anacarsis, that there is a paradise discoverable that all costumes ought to hold man. O oh, Anacarsis, it is a headlong, swift-going faith. Mounted thereon, meseems, thou art bound hastily for the city of nowhere, and wilt arrive. At best, we may say, arrive in good riding attitude, which indeed is something. So many new persons, and new things, have come to occupy this France. Her old speech and thought, and activity which springs from those, are all changing, fermenting towards unknown issues. To the dullest peasant, as he sits sluggish, overtoiled, by his evening hearth, one idea has come, that of shadows burnt, of shadows combustible. How altered all coffee houses, in province or capital. The Ander de Procope has now other questions than the three stagerite unities to settle, not theatre controversies, but a world controversy, there, in the ancient pigtail mode, or with modern Brutus heads, do well frizzed logicians hold hubbub, and chaos umpire sits. The ever-enduring melody of Paris saloons has got a new ground tone, ever-enduring, which has been heard, and by the listening heaven too, since Julian the Apostate's time and earlier, mad now as formerly. Ex censor Suart, ex censor, for we have freedom of the press, he may be seen there, impartial, even neutral. Tyrant Grimm rolls large eyes, over a questionable coming time. Atheist Najin, beloved disciple of Diderot, crows, in his small difficult way, heralding glad dawn. But, on the other hand, how many morellets, Marmentals, who had sat all their life hatching philosoph eggs, cackle now, in a state bordering on distraction, at the brew they have brought out. It was so delightful to have one's philosoph theorem demonstrated, crowned in the saloons, and now an infatuated people will not continue speculative, but have practice? There also observe preceptress Jean Lee, or Sillery, or Sillery Jean Lee, for our husband is both Count and Marquis, and we have more than one title. Pretentious, frothy, a Puritan yet creedless, darkening counsel by words without wisdom. For, it is in that thin element of the sentimentalist and distinguished female that Sillery Jean Lee works. She would gladly be sincere, yet can grow no sincerer than sincere can, sincere can of many forms, ending in the devotional form. For the present, on a neck still of moderate whiteness, she wears as jewel a miniature Bastille, cut on mere sandstone, but then actual Bastille sandstone. M. Lamarquis is one of Dorleans errandmen, in National Assembly, and elsewhere. Madam, for her part, trains up a youthful Dorleon generation in what superfinest morality one can, gives meanwhile rather enigmatic account of fair Mademoiselle Pamela, the daughter whom she has adopted. Thus she, in Palais Royal Saloon, whither, we remark, Dorleon himself, spite of Lafayette, has returned from that English mission of his, surely no pleasant mission, for the English would not speak to him, and Saint Hannah Moore of England, so unlike Saint Sillery Jean Lee of France, saw him shunned, in Vauxhall Gardens, like one pest struck, and his red-blue impassive visage waxing hardly a shade bluer. Chapter 2.14. Journalism. As for constitutionalism, with its national guards, it is doing what it can, 
and has enough to do, it must, as ever, with one hand wave persuasively, repressing patriotism, and keep the other clenched to menace royalty plotters. A most delicate task, requiring tact. Thus, if people's friend Murat has today his writ of prise de corps, or seizure of body, served on him, and dives out of sight, tomorrow he is left at large, or is even encouraged, as a sort of bandog whose baying may be useful. President Danton, in open hall, with reverberating voice, declares that, in a case like Murat's, force may be resisted by force. Whereupon the Châtelet serves Danton also with a writ, which, however, as the whole Cordelier's district responds to it, what constable will be prompt to execute? Twice more, on new occasions, does the Châtelet launch its writ, and twice more in vain, the body of Danton cannot be seized by Châtelet, he unseized, should he even fly for a season, shall behold the Châtelet itself flung into limbo. Municipality and Brissot, meanwhile, are far on with their municipal constitution. The sixty districts shall become forty-eight sections, much shall be adjusted, and Paris have its constitution. A constitution wholly elective, as indeed all French government shall and must be. And yet, one fatal element has been introduced, that of citoyen actif. No man who does not pay the mark d'argent, or yearly tax equal to three days' labor shall be other than a passive citizen, not the slightest vote for him, were he acting, all the year round, with sledgehammer, with forest leveling axe. Unheard of. Cry patriot journals. Yes truly, my patriot friends, if liberty, the passion and prayer of all men's souls, means liberty to send your fifty thousandth part of a new tongue fencer into national debating club, then, be the God's witness, ye are hardly entreated. Oh, if in national palaver, as the Africans name it, such blessedness is verily found, what tyrant would deny it to son of Adam? Nay, might there not be a female parliament too, with screams from the opposition benches, and the honourable member borne out in hysterics? To a children's parliament would I gladly consent, or even lower if ye wished it. Beloved brothers. Liberty, one might fear, is actually, as the ancient wise men said, of heaven. On this earth, where, thinks the enlightened public, did a brave little dame de Stahl, not Necker's daughter, but a far shrewder than she, find the nearest approach to liberty? After mature computation, cool as Dilworth's, her answer is, in the Bastille. Of heaven? Answer many, asking. Woe that they should ask, for that is the very misery. Of heaven means much, share in the national palaver it may, or may as probably not mean. One sense galotic bow that cannot fail to flourish is journalism. The voice of the people being the voice of God, shall not such divine voice make itself heard. To the ends of France, and in as many dialects as when the first great Babel was to be built. Some loud as the lion, some small as the sucking dove. Mirabeau himself has his instructive journal or journals, with Geneva Hodman working in them, and with all his quarrels enough with Dame Le Jay, his female bookseller, so ultra-compliant otherwise. King's friend Royu still prints himself. Barrier sheds tears of loyal sensibility in break of day journal, though with declining sale. But why is Frerin so hot, democratic, Frerin, the king's friend's nephew? He has it by kind, that heat of his, wasp Frerin begot him, Voltaire's Frelon, who fought stinging, while sting and poison bag were left, were only as reviewer, an overprinted waste paper. Constant, illuminative, as the nightly lamplighter, issues the useful monitor, for it has now become diurnal, with facts and few commentaries, official, safe in the middle, its able editor sunk long since, recoverably or irrecoverably, in deep darkness. Acid loose to low, with his vigor, as of young slows, shall never ripen, but die untimely, his prudum, however, will not let that revolution to Paris die, but edited himself, with much else, dull blustering printer though he be. Of Cassandra Marat we have spoken often, yet the most surprising truth remains to be spoken, that he actually does not want sense, but, with croaking gelid throat, croaks out masses of the truth, on several things. Nay sometimes, one might almost fancy he had a perception of humour, and were laughing a little, far down in his inner man. Camille is wittier than ever, and more outspoken, cynical, yet sunny as ever. A light melodious creature, born, as he shall yet say with bitter tears, to write verses, light Apollo, so clear, soft loosen, in this war of the titans, wherein he shall not conquer. Folded and hawk newspapers exist in all countries, but, in such a journalistic element as this of France, other and stranger sorts are to be anticipated. What says the English reader to a journal affiche, placard journal, legible to him that has no halfpenny, in bright prismatic colours, calling the eye from afar? Such, in the coming months, as patriot associations, public and private, advance, and can subscribe funds, shall plenteously hang themselves out, leaves, limed leaves, to catch what they can. 
The very government shall have its pasted journal, louvre it, busy yet with a new charming romance, shall write sentinelle, and post them with effect, nay Bertrand de Molville, in his extremity, shall still more cunningly try it. Great is journalism. Is not every able editor a ruler of the world, being a persuader of it, though self-elected, yet sanctioned, by the sale of his numbers? Whom indeed the world has the readiest method of deposing, should need be, that of merely doing nothing to him, which ends in starvation. Nor esteem it small what those bill stickers had to do in Paris, above three score of them, all with their crossbowls, haversacks, past depots, nay with leaden badges, for the municipality licenses them. A sacred college, properly of world rulers' heralds, though not respected as such, in an era still incipient and raw. They made the walls of Paris didactic, suasive, with an ever fresh periodical literature, wherein he that ran might read, placard journals, placard lampoons, municipal ordinances, royal proclamations, a whole other or vulgar placard department superadded, or omitted from contempt. What unutterable things the stone walls spoke, during these five years. But it is all gone, today swallowing yesterday, and then being in its turn swallowed of tomorrow, even as speech ever is. Nay what, O thou immortal man of letters, is writing itself but speech conserved for a time? The placard journal conserved it for one day, some books conserve it for the matter of ten years, nay some for three thousand, but what then? Why, then, the years being all run, it also dies, and the world is rid of it. Oh, were there not a spirit in the word of man, as in man himself, that survived the audible-bodied word, and tended either Godward, or else devilward forevermore, why should he trouble himself much with the truth of it, or the falsehood of it, except for commercial purposes? His immortality indeed, and whether it shall last half a lifetime, or a lifetime and half, is not that a very considerable thing? As mortality, was to the runaway, whom great Fritz bullied back into the battle with a, r, Voltier a Vic Levin, unprintable off scouring of scoundrels, would ye live forever? This is the communication of thought, how happy when there is any thought to communicate. Neither let the simpler old methods be neglected, in their sphere. The Palais Royal Tent, a tyrannous patrolitism has removed, but can it remove the lungs of man? Anaxagoras Chomet we saw mounted on born stones, while Talion works sedentary at the subeditorial desk. In any corner of the civilized world, a tub can be inverted, and an articulate speaking biped mount thereon. Nay, with contrivance, a portable trestle, or folding stool, can be procured, for love or money, this the peripatetic orator can take in his hand, and, driven out here, set it up again there, saying mildly, with a sage bias, omnia mea mecum portu. Such is journalism, hawked, tasted, spoken. How changed since one old metro walked this same Tuileries garden, in gilt-cocked hat, with journal at his nose, or held loose folded behind his back, and was a notability of Paris, Metra the newsman, and Louis himself was wont to say, when did Metra? Since the first Venetian news sheet was sold for a Gaza, or farthing, and named Gazette. We live in a fertile world. Chapter 2.1.V. Clubism. Where the heart is full, it seeks, for a thousand reasons, in a thousand ways, to impart itself. How sweet, indispensable, in such cases, is fellowship, soul mystically strengthening soul. The meditative Germans, some think, have been of opinion that enthusiasm in the general means simply excessive congregating, schwarmery, or swarming. At any rate, do we not see glimmering half-red embers, if laid together, get into the brightest white glow? In such a France, gregarious reunions will needs multiply, intensify, French life will step out of doors, and, from domestic, become a public club life. Old clubs, which already germinated, grow and flourish, new everywhere bud forth. It is the sure symptom of social unrest, in such way, most infallibly of all, does social unrest exhibit itself, find solacement, and also nutriment. In every French head there hangs now, whether for terror or for hope, some prophetic picture of a new France, prophecy which brings, nay which almost is, its own fulfillment, and in all ways, consciously and unconsciously, works towards that. Observe, moreover, how the aggregative principle, let it be but deep enough, goes on aggregating, and this even in a geometrical progression, how when the whole world, in such a plastic time, is forming itself into clubs, some one club, the strongest or luckiest, shall, by friendly attracting, by victorious compelling, grow ever stronger, till it become immeasurably strong, and all the others, with their strength, be either lovingly absorbed into it, or hostily abolished by it. This if the club spirit is universal, if the time is plastic. Plastic enough is the time, universal the club spirit, such an all-absorbing, paramount one club cannot be wanting. 
What a progress, since the first salient point of the Breton Committee. It worked long in secret, not languidly, it has come with the National Assembly to Paris, calls itself club, calls itself in imitation, as is thought, of those generous Price Stanhope English, French Revolution Club, but soon, with more originality, Club of Friends of the Constitution. Moreover it has leased, for itself, at a fair rent, the Hall of the Jacobins Convent, one of our superfluous edifices, and does therefrom now, in these spring months, begin shining out on an admiring Paris. And so, by degrees, under the shorter popular title of Jacobins Club, it shall become memorable to all times and lands. Glance into the interior, strongly yet modestly benched and seated, as many as 1300 chosen patriots, assembly members not a few. Varnav, the two Lameths are seen there, occasionally Mirabeau, perpetually Robespierre, also the ferret visage of Fiquet Tinville with other attorneys, Anacarsis of Prussian Scythia, and miscellaneous patriots, though all is yet in the most perfectly clean washed state, decent, nay dignified. President on platform, President's bell are not wanting, or rhetorical tribune high raised, nor strangers' galleries, wherein also sit women. Has any French antiquarian society preserved that written lease of the Jacobins' convent hall? Or was it, unluckier even than Magna Carta, clipped by sacrilegious tailors? Universal history is not indifferent to it. These friends of the Constitution have met mainly, as their name may foreshadow, to look after elections when an election comes, and procure fit men but likewise to consult generally that the common will take no damage, one as yet sees not how. For indeed let two or three gather together anywhere, if it be not in church, where all are bound to the passive state, no mortal can say accurately, themselves as little as any, for what they are gathered. How often has the broached barrel proved not to be for joy and heart effusion, but for duel and head breakage, and the promised feast become a feast of the lapathy. This Jacobin's club, which at first shone resplendent, and was thought to be a new celestial sun for enlightening the nations, had, as things all have, to work through its appointed phases, it burned unfortunately more and more lurid, more sulphurous, distracted, and swam at last, through the astonished heaven, like a Tartarian portent, and lurid burning prison of spirits and pain. Its style of eloquence? Rejoice, reader, that thou knowest it not, that thou canst never perfectly know. The Jacobins published a journal of debates, where they that have the heart may examine, impassioned, full droning patriotic eloquence, implacable, unfertile, save for destruction, which was indeed its work, most wearisome, though most deadly. Be thankful that oblivion covers so much, that all carrion is by and by buried in the green earth's bosom, and even makes her grow the greener. The Jacobins are buried, but their work is not, it continues making the tour of the world, as it can. It might be seen lately, for instance, with bared bosom and death defiant eye, as far on as Greek Missolandi, and, strange enough, old slumbering Hellas was resuscitated, into somnambulism which will become clear wakefulness, by a voice from the Rue Saint Honoré. All dies, as we often say, except the spirit of man, of what man does. Thus has not the very house of the Jacobins vanished, scarcely lingering in a few old men's memories? The Saint Honoré market has brushed it away, and now where dull droning eloquence, like a trump of doom, once shook the world, there is pacific chaffering for poultry and greens. The sacred National Assembly Hall itself has become common ground, President's platform permeable to Wayne and Duskart, for the Rue de Rivoli runs there. Verily, at Cockro, of this cock or the other, all apparitions do melt and dissolve in space. The Paris Jacobins became the mother society, Societe Mera, and had as many as 300 shrill tongued daughters in direct correspondence with her. Of indirectly corresponding, what we may call granddaughters and minute progeny, she counted 44,000. But for the present we note only two things, the first of them a mere anecdote. One night, a couple of brother Jacobins are doorkeepers, for the members take this post of duty and honor in rotation, and admit none that have not tickets, one doorkeeper was the worthy Sir Lice, a patriotic opera singer, stricken in years, whose windpipe is long since closed without result, the other, young, and named Louis-Philippe, d'Orléans firstborn, has in this latter time, after unheard of destinies, become citizen king, and struggles to rule for a season. All flesh is grass, higher reed grass or creeping herb. The second thing we have to note is historical, that the mother society, even in this its effulgent period, cannot content all patriots. Already it must throw off, so to speak, two dissatisfied swarms, a swarm to the right, a swarm to the left. One party, which thinks the Jacobins lukewarm, constitutes itself into club of the Cordeliers, a hotter club, it is Danton's element, with whom goes de Moulin. The other party, again, which thinks the Jacobin scalding hot, flies off to the right, and becomes club of 1789, 
friends of the monarchic constitution. They are afterwards named Foyons Club, their place of meeting being the Foyons Convent. Lafayette is, or becomes, their chief man, supported by the respectable patriot everywhere, by the mass of property and intelligence, with the most flourishing prospects. They, in these June days of 1790, do, in the Palais Royal, dine solemnly with open windows, to the cheers of the people, with toasts, with inspiriting songs, with one song at least, among the feeblest ever sung. They shall, in due time be hooted forth, over the borders, into Sumerian night. Another expressly monarchic or royalist club, Club des Monarchians, though a club of ample funds, and all sitting in damask sofas, cannot realize the smallest momentary cheer, realizes only scoffs and groans, till, ere long, certain patriots in disorderly sufficient number, proceed thither, for a night or for nights, and groan it out of pain. Vivacious alone shall the mother society and her family be. The very Cordeliers may, as it were, return into her bosom, which will have grown warm enough. Fatal looking. Are not such societies an incipient new order of society itself? The aggregative principle anew at work in a society grown obsolete, cracked asunder, dissolving into rubbish and primary atoms? Chapter 2.1.Vi. J. Le Jury. With these signs of the times, is it not surprising that the dominant feeling all over France was still continually hope? O oh, blessed hope, sole boon of man, whereby, on his straight prison walls, are painted beautiful far-stretching landscapes, and into the night of very death is shed holiest dawn. Thou art to all an indefeasible possession in this God's world, to the wisest sacred Constantine's banner, written on the eternal skies, under which they shall conquer, for the battle itself is victory, to the foolish some secular mirage, or shadow of still waters, painted on the parched earth, whereby at least their dusty pilgrimage, if devious, becomes cheerfuller, becomes possible. In the death tumults of a sinking society, French hope sees only the birth struggles of a new unspeakably better society, and sings, with full assurance of faith, her brisk melody, which some inspired fiddler has in these very days composed for her, the world-famous Syrah. Yes, that will go, and then there will come. All men hope, even Marat hopes, that patriotism will take muffin dirk. King Louis is not without hope, in the chapter of chances, in a flight to some buoy, in getting popularized at Paris. But what a hoping people he had, judged by the fact, and series of facts, now to be noted. Poor Louis, meaning the best, with little insight and even less determination of his own, has to follow, in that dim wayfaring of his, such signal as may be given him, by backstairs royalism, by official or backstairs constitutionalism, whichever for the month may have convinced the royal mind. If flight to buoy, and, horrible to think, a drawing of the civil sword do hang his theory, portentous in the background, much nearer is this fact of these twelve hundred kings, who sit in the salle de menage. Kings uncontrollable by him, not yet irreverent to him. Could kind management of these but prosper, how much better were it than armed emigrants, torrent intrigues, and the help of Austria? Nay, are the two hopes inconsistent? Rides in the suburbs, we have found, cost little, yet they always brought vivats. Still cheaper is a soft word, such as has many times turned away wrath. In these rapid days, while France is all getting divided into departments, clergy about to be remodeled, popular societies rising, and feudalism and so much ever is ready to be hurled into the melting pot, might one not try? On the 4th of February, accordingly, M. Le Président reads to his National Assembly a short autograph, announcing that His Majesty will step over, quite in an unceremonious way, probably about noon. Think, therefore, messieurs, what it may mean, especially, how you will get the hall decorated a little. The Secretary's Bureau can be shifted down from the platform, on the President's chair be slipped this cover of velvet, of a violet color sprigged with gold fleur-de-lis, for indeed M. Le Président has had previous notice underhand, and taken counsel with Dr. Guillotin. Then some fraction of velvet carpet, of like texture and color, cannot that be spread in front of the chair, where the Secretaries usually sit. So has judicious Guillotin advised, and the effect is found satisfactory. Moreover, as it is probable that His Majesty, in spite of the fleur de lis velvet, will stand and not sit at all, the President himself, in the interim, presides standing. And so, while some honorable member is discussing, say, the division of a department, ushers announce, His Majesty. In person, with small suite, and Her Majesty, the honorable member stops short, the assembly starts to its feet, the twelve hundred kings almost all, and the galleries no less, do welcome the restorer of French liberty with loyal shouts. His Majesty's speech, in diluted conventional phraseology, expresses this mainly, that he, most of all Frenchmen, rejoices to see France getting regenerated, is sure, at the same time, 
that they will deal gently with her in the process, and not regenerate her roughly. Such was his majesty's speech, the feat he performed was coming to speak it, and going back again. Surely, except to a very hoping people, there was not much here to build upon. Yet what did they not build? The fact that the king has spoken, that he has voluntarily come to speak, how inexpressibly encouraging. Did not the glance of his royal countenance, like concentrated sunbeams, kindle all hearts in an august assembly, nay thereby in an inflammable enthusiastic France? To move deputation of thanks can be the happy lot of but one man, to go in such deputation the lot of not many. The deputed have gone, and returned with what highest flown compliment they could, whom also the queen met, often in hand. And still do not our hearts burn with insatiable gratitude, and to one other man a still higher blessedness suggests itself, to move that we all renew the national oath. Happiest honorable member, with his word so in season as word seldom was, magic fugal man of a whole national assembly, which sat there bursting to do somewhat, fugal man of a whole onlooking France. The president swears, declares that every one shall swear, in distinct J. Le jury. Nay the very gallery sends him down a written slip signed, with their oath on it, and as the assembly now casts an eye that way, the gallery all stands up and swears again. And then out of doors, consider at the Hotel de Ville how by e, the great tennis court swearer, again swears, towards nightfall, with all the municipals, and heads of districts assembled there. And M. Danton suggests that the public would like to partake, whereupon by e, with escort of twelve, steps forth to the great outer staircase, sways the ebullient multitude with stretched hand, takes their oath, with the thunder of rolling drums, with shouts that rend the welkin. And on all streets the glad people, with moisture and fire in their eyes, spontaneously formed groups, and swore one another, and the whole city was illuminated. This was the 4th of February 1790, a day to be marked white in constitutional annals. Nor is the illumination for a night only, but partially or totally at last a series of nights. For each district, the electors of each district, will swear specially, and always as the district swears, it illuminates itself. Behold them, district after district, in some open square, where the non-electing people can all see and join, with their uplifted right hands, and jail a jury, with rolling drums, with embracings, and that infinite hurrah of the enfranchised, which any tyrant that there may be can consider. Faithful to the king, to the law, to the constitution which the National Assembly shall make. Fancy, for example, the professors of universities parading the streets with their young France, and swearing, in an enthusiastic manner, not without tumult. By a larger exercise of fancy, expand duly this little word, the like was repeated in every town and district of France. Nay one patriot mother, in Lignon of Brittany, assembles her ten children, and, with her own aged hand, swears them all herself, a high-souled venerable woman. Of all which, moreover, a national assembly must be eloquently apprised. Such three weeks of swearing. Saw the sun ever such a swearing people? Have they been bit by a swearing tarantula? No, but they are men and Frenchmen, they have hope, and, singular to say, they have faith, were it only in the gospel according to Jean Jacques. Oh my brothers! Would to heaven it were even as ye think and have sworn. But there are lovers' oaths, which, had they been true as love itself, cannot be kept, not to speak of dicer's oaths, also a known sort. Chapter 2.17. Prodigies. To such length had the contra social brought it, in believing hearts. Man, as is well said, lives by faith, each generation has its own faith, more or less, and less at the faith of its predecessor, most unwisely. Grant indeed that this faith in the social contract belongs to the stranger sorts, that an unborn generation may very wisely, if not laugh, yet stare at it, and piously consider. For, alas, what is contra? If all men were such that a mere spoken or sworn contract would bind them, all men were then true men, and government a superfluity. Not what thou and I have promised to each other, but what the balance of our forces can make us perform to each other, that, in so sinful a world as ours, is the thing to be counted on. But above all, a people and a sovereign promising to one another, as if a whole people, changing from generation to generation, nay from hour to hour, could ever by any method be made to speak or promise, and to speak mere solecisms we, be the heaven's witness, which heavens however do no miracles now, we, ever-changing millions, will allow thee, changeful unit, to force us or govern us. The world has perhaps seen few faiths comparable to that. So nevertheless had the world then construed the matter. Had they not so construed it, how different had their hopes been, their attempts, their results. But so and not otherwise did the upper powers will it to be. Freedom by social contract, such was verily the gospel of that era. And all men had believed in it, as in a heaven's glad tidings men should, and with overflowing heart and uplifted voice clave to it, 
and stood fronting time and eternity on it. Nay smile not, or only with a smile sadder than tears. This too was a better faith than the one it had replaced, than faith merely in the everlasting nothing and man's digestive power, lower than which no faith can go. Not that such universally prevalent, universally durant, feeling of hope, could be a unanimous one. Far from that. The time was ominous, social dissolution near and certain, social renovation still a problem, difficult and distant even though sure. But if ominous to some clearest onlooker, whose faith stood not with one side or with the other, nor in the ever-vexed jarring of Greek with Greek at all, how unspeakably ominous to dim royalist participators, for whom royalism was mankind's palladium, for whom, with the abolition of most Christian kingship and most Talleyrand bishopship, all loyal obedience, all religious faith was to expire, and final night envelope the destinies of man. On serious hearts, of that persuasion, the matter sinks down deep, prompting, as we have seen, to backstairs plots, to emigration with pledge of war, to monarchic clubs, nay to still matter things. The spirit of prophecy, for instance, had been considered extinct for some centuries, nevertheless these last times, as indeed is the tendency of last times, do revive it, that so, of French mad things, we might have sample also of the maddest. In remote rural districts, whither philosophism has not yet radiated, where a heterodox constitution of the clergy is bringing strife round the altar itself, and the very church bells are getting melted into small money coin, it appears probable that the end of the world cannot be far off. Deep musing atrabiliar old men, especially old women, hint in an obscure way that they know what they know. The Holy Virgin, silent so long, has not gone dumb, and truly now, if ever more in this world, were the time for her to speak. One prophetess, though careless historians have omitted her name, condition, and whereabout, becomes audible to the general ear, credible to not a few, credible to Friar Gurley, poor patriot Chartreux, in the National Assembly itself. She, Pampithonus recitative, with wild staring eye, sings that there shall be a sign, that the heavenly sun himself will hang out a sign, or mock sun, which, many say, shall be stamped with a head of hang favorous. List, Dom Gurley, with that poor addled pole of thine, list, O oh list, and hear nothing. Notable however was that magnetic vellum, villain magnetic, of the Sears Tozier in Petitchen, Parliamenteers of Rouen. Sweet young Tozier, bred in the faith of his missal, and of parchment genealogies, and of parchment generally, a dust, melancholic, middle-aged Petitchen, why came these two to St. Cloud, where His Majesty was hunting, on the festival of St. Peter and St. Paul, and waited there, in antechambers, a wonder to whispering Swiss, the livelong day, and even waited without the greats, when turned out, and had dismissed their valets to Paris, as with purpose of endless waiting. They have a magnetic vellum, these two, where on the Virgin, wonderfully clothing herself in mesmery and caliostric occult philosophy, has inspired them to jot down instructions and predictions for a much straitened king. To whom, by higher order, they will this day present it, and save the monarchy and world. Unaccountable pair of visual objects. Ye should be men, and of the eighteenth century, but your magnetic vellum forbids us so to interpret. Say, are ye aught? Thus asked the guardhouse captains, the mayor of St. Cloud, nay, at great length, thus asked the committee of researches, and not the municipal, but the national assembly one. No distinct answer, for weeks. At last it becomes plain that the right answer is negative. Go, ye chimeras, with your magnetic vellum, sweet young chimera, a dust middle-aged one. The prison doors are open. Hardly again shall ye preside the Rouen chamber of accounts, but vanish obscurely into limbo. Chapter 2.18. Solemn League and Covenant. Such dim masses, and specks of even deepest black, work in that white-hot glow of the French mind, now wholly in fusion, and confusion. Old women here swearing their ten children on the new evangel of Jean Jacques, old women there looking up for favor as heads in the celestial luminary, these are preternatural signs, prefiguring somewhat. In fact, to the patriot children of hope themselves, it is undeniable that difficulties exist, emigrating seigneurs, parlement in sneaking but most malicious mutiny, though the rope is round their neck, above all, the most decided deficiency of grains. Sorrowful, but, to a nation that hopes, not irremediable. To a nation which is in fusion and ardent communion of thought, which, for example, on signal of one fugal man, will lift its right hand like a drilled regiment, and swear and illuminate, till every village from Ardennes to the Pyrenees has rolled its village drum, and sent up its little oaf, and glimmer of tallow illumination some fathoms into the rain of night. If grains are defective, the fault is not of nature or national assembly, but of art and antinational intriguers. Such malign individuals, of the scoundrel species, have power to vex us, while the constitution is a-making. Endure it, 
ye heroic patriots, nay rather, why not cure it? Grains do grow, they lie extant there in sheaf or sack, only that regraders and royalist plotters, to provoke the people into illegality, obstruct the transport of grains. Quick, ye organized patriot authorities, armed national guards, meet together, unite your goodwill, in union is tenfold strength, let the concentred flash of your patriotism strike stealthy scoundrelism blind, paralytic, as with a coup de soleil. Under which hat or nightcap of the twenty-five millions, this pregnant idea first rose, for in some one head it did rise, no man can now say. A most small idea, near at hand for the whole world, but a living one, fit, and which waxed, whether into greatness or not, into a measurable size. When a nation is in this state that the fugal man can operate on it, what will the word in season, the act in season, not do? It will grow verily, like the boy's bean in the fairy tale, heaven high, with habitations and adventures on it, in one night. It is nevertheless unfortunately still a bean, for your long-lived oak grows not so, and, the next night, it may lie felled, horizontal, trodden into common mud. But remark, at least, how natural to any agitated nation, which has faith, this business of covenanting is. The Scotch, believing in a righteous heaven above them, and also in a gospel, far other than the Jean-Jacques one, swore, in their extreme need, a solemn league and covenant, as brothers on the forlorn hope, and imminence of battle, who embrace looking Godward, and got the whole isle to swear it, and even, in their tough old Saxon Hebrew Presbyterian way, to keep it more or less, for the thing, as such things are, was heard in heaven, and partially ratified there, neither is it yet dead, if thou wilt look, nor like to die. The French too, with their Gallic ethnic excitability and effervescence, have, as we have seen, real faith, of a sort, they are hard bestead, though in the middle of hope, a national solemn league and covenant there may be in France too, under how different conditions, with how different development and issue. Note, accordingly, the small commencement, first spark of a mighty firework, for if the particular hat cannot be fixed upon, the particular district can. On the 29th day of last November, were national guards by the thousand seen filing, from far and near, with military music, with municipal officers in tricolor sashes, towards and along the Rhone stream, to the little town of Etoile. There with ceremonial evolution and maneuver, with fanfarinating, musketry salvos, and what else the patriot genius could devise, they made oath and obtestation to stand faithfully by one another, under law and king, in particular, to have all manner of grains, while grains there were, freely circulated, in spite both of robber and regrader. This was the meeting of Etoile, in the mild end of November 1789. But now, if a mere empty review, followed by review dinner, ball, and such gesticulation and flirtation as there may be, interests the happy county town, and makes it the envy of surrounding county towns, how much more might this? In a fortnight, larger Montilimart, half ashamed of itself, will do as good, and better. On the plain of Montilimart, or what is equally sonorous, under the walls of Montilimart, the 13th of December sees new gathering and obtestation, 6,000 strong, and now indeed, with these three remarkable improvements, as unanimously resolved on there. First that the men of Montilimar do federate with the already federated men of Etoile. Second, that, implying not expressing the circulation of grain, they swear in the face of God and their country with much more emphasis and comprehensiveness, to obey all decrees of the National Assembly, and see them obeyed, till death, jusqu'à la mort. Third, and most important, that official record of all this be solemnly delivered into the National Assembly, to M. De Lafayette, and to the restorer of French liberty, who shall all take what comfort from it they can. Thus does larger Montilimart vindicate its patriot importance, and maintain its rank in the municipal scale. And so, with the new year, the signal is hoisted, for is not a national assembly, and solemn deliverance there, at lowest a national telegraph? Not only grain shall circulate, while there is grain, on highways or the Rhone waters, over all that southeastern region, where also if Monsignor d'Artois saw good to break in from Turin, hot welcome might wait him, but whatsoever province of France is straitened for grain, or vexed with a mutinous parlement, unconstitutional plotters, monarchic clubs, or any other patriot ailment, can go and do likewise, or even do better. And now, especially, when the February swearing has set them all agog. From Brittany to Burgundy, on most plains of France, under most city walls, it is a blaring of trumpets, waving of banners, a constitutional maneuvering, under the vernal skies, while nature too is putting forth her green hopes, under bright sunshine defaced by the stormful east, like patriotism victorious, though with difficulty, over aristocracy and defect of grain. Their march and constitutionally wheel, to the Saira ing mood of fife and drum, under their tricolor municipals, 
our clear gleaming phalanxes, or halt, with uplifted right hand, and artillery salvos that imitate Jove's thunder, and all the country, and metaphorically all the universe, is looking on. Holy, in their best apparel, brave men, and beautifully dizened women, most of whom have lovers there, swearing, by the eternal heavens and this green growing all nutritive earth, that France is free. Sweetest days, when, astonishing to say, mortals have actually met together in communion and fellowship, and man, were it only once through long despicable centuries, is for moments verily the brother of man. And then the deputations to the National Assembly, with high-flown descriptive harangue, to M. de Lafayette, and the Restorer, very frequently moreover to the mother of patriotism sitting on her stout benches in that hall of the Jacobins. The general ear is filled with federation. New names of patriots emerge, which shall one day become familiar, Boyer Fonfried eloquent denunciator of a rebellious Bordeaux Parlement, Max Isnar eloquent reporter of the Federation of Draguignan, eloquent pair, separated by the whole breadth of France, who are nevertheless to me. Ever wider burns the flame of federation, ever wider and also brighter. Thus the Brittany and Anjou brethren mention a fraternity of all true Frenchmen, and go the length of invoking perdition and death on any renegade, moreover, if in their National Assembly harangue, they glance plaintively at the Marc d'Argent which makes so many citizens passive, they, over in the mother society, ask, being henceforth themselves neither Bretons nor Angevins but French, why all France has not one federation, and universal oath of brotherhood, once for all? A most pertinent suggestion, dating from the end of March which pertinent suggestion the whole patriot world cannot but catch, and reverberate and agitate till it become loud, which, in that case, the town hall municipals had better take up, and meditate. Some universal federation seems inevitable, the where is given, clearly Paris, only the when, the how. These also productive time will give, is already giving. For always as the federative work goes on, it perfects itself, and patriot genius adds contribution after contribution. Thus, at Lyons, in the end of the May month, we behold as many as fifty, or some say sixty thousand, met to federate, and a multitude looking on, which it would be difficult to number. From dawn to dusk. For our lion's guardsmen took rank, at five in the bright dewy morning, came pouring in, bright gleaming, to the Quai de Rome, to march thence to the federation field, amid wavings of hats and lady handkerchiefs, glad shoutings of some two hundred thousand patriot voices and hearts, the beautiful and brave. Among whom, courting no notice, and yet the notablest of all, what queen-like figure is this, with her escort of house friends and Champagne the patriot editor, come abroad with the earliest? Radiant with enthusiasm are those dark eyes, is that strong Minerva face, looking dignity and earnest joy, joyful as she were all are joyful. It is Roland de la Platriere's wife. Strict elderly Roland, king's inspector of manufactures here, and now likewise, by popular choice, the strictest of our new Lyons municipals, a man who has gained much, if worth and faculty be gain but above all things, has gained to wife flip on the Paris engraver's daughter. Reader, mark that queen-like burger woman, beautiful, Amazonian graceful to the eye, more so to the mind. Unconscious of her worth, as all worth is, of her greatness, of her crystal clearness, genuine, the creature of sincerity and nature, in an age of artificiality, pollution and cant, there, in her still completeness, in her still invincibility, she, if thou knew it, is the noblest of all living Frenchwomen, and will be seen, one day. Oh blessed rather while unseen, even of herself. For the present she gazes, nothing doubting, into this grand theatricality, and thinks her young dreams are to be fulfilled. From dawn to dusk, as we said, it lasts, and truly a sight like few. Flourishes of drums and trumpets are something, but think of an artificial rock fifty feet high, all cut into crag steps, not without the similitude of shrubs. The interior cavity, for in sooth it is made of deal, stands solemn, a temple of Concord, on the outer summit rises a statue of liberty, colossal, seen for miles, with her pike and Phrygian cap, and civic column, at her feet a country's altar, Hotel de la Patrie, on all which neither deal timber nor lath and plaster, with paint of various colors, have been spared. But fancy then the banners all placed on the steps of the rock, high mass chaunted, and the civic oath of fifty thousand, with what volcanic outburst of sound from iron and other throats, enough to frighten back the very son and Rhone, and how the brightest fireworks, and balls, and even repasts closed in that night of the gods. And so the Lions' Federation vanishes too, swallowed of darkness, and yet not wholly, for our brave fair Roland was there. Also she, though in the deepest privacy, writes her narrative of it in Champagne's Courier de Lyons, a piece which circulates to the extent of sixty thousand, which one would like now to read. But on the whole, Paris, we may see, will have little to devise, will only have to borrow and apply. 
and then as to the day, what day of all the calendar is fit, if the Bastille anniversary be not. The particular spot too, it is easy to see, must be the Cham de Mars, where many a Julian the apostate has been lifted on bucklers, to France's or the world's sovereignty, and iron franks, loud clanging, have responded to the voice of a Charlemagne, and from of old mere sublimities have been familiar. Chapter 2.19. Symbolic. How natural, in all decisive circumstances, is symbolic representation to all kinds of men. Nay, what is man's whole terrestrial life but a symbolic representation, and making visible, of the celestial invisible force that is in him? By act and word he strives to do it, with sincerity, if possible, failing that, with theatricality, which latter also may have its meaning. An almax masquerade is not nothing, in more genial ages, your Christmas guisings, feasts of the ass, abbots of unreason, were a considerable something, since sport they were, as almax may still be sincere wish for sport. But what, on the other hand, must not sincere earnest have been, say, a Hebrew feast of tabernacles have been. A whole nation gathered, in the name of the highest, under the eye of the highest, imagination herself flagging under the reality, and all noblest ceremony is yet not grown ceremonial, but solemn, significant to the outmost fringe. Neither, in modern private life, are theatrical scenes, of tearful women wedding whole elves of cambric in concert, of impassioned bushy-whiskered youth threatening suicide, and such like, to be so entirely detested, drop thou a tear over them thyself rather. At any rate, one can remark that no nation will throw by its work, and deliberately go out to make a scene, without meaning something thereby. For indeed no scenic individual, with knavish hypocritical views, will take the trouble to soliloquize a scene, and now consider, is not a scenic nation placed precisely in that predicament of soliloquizing, for its own behoof alone, to solace its own sensibilities, maudlin or other? Yet in this respect, of readiness for scenes, the difference of nations, as of men, is very great. If our Saxon Puritanic friends, for example, swore and signed their national covenant, without discharge of gunpowder, or the beating of any drum, in a dingy covenant close of the Edinburgh High Street, in a mean room, where men now drink mean liquor, it was consistent with their way so to swear it. Our Gallic encyclopedic friends, again, must have a Cham de Mars, scene of all the world, or universe, and such a scenic exhibition, to which the Colosseum Amphitheatre was but a stroller's barn, as this old globe of ours had never or hardly ever beheld. Which method also we reckon natural, then and there. Nor perhaps was the respective keeping of these two oaths far out of due proportion to such respective display in taking them, inverse proportion, namely. For the theatricality of a people goes in a compound ratio, ratio indeed of their trustfulness, sociability, fervency, but then also of their excitability, of their porosity, not continent, or say, of their explosiveness, hot flashing, but which does not last. How true also, once more, is it that no man or nation of men, conscious of doing a great thing, was ever in that thing, doing other than a small one. O oh, Cham de Mars Federation, with three hundred drummers, twelve hundred wind musicians, and artillery planted on height after height to boom the tidings of it all over France, in few minutes. Could no atheist Nagin contrive to discern, eighteen centuries off, those thirteen most poor mean dressed men, at frugal supper, in a mean Jewish dwelling, with no symbol but hearts got initiated into the divine depth of sorrow, and to do this in remembrance of me, and so cease that small difficult crowing of his, if he were not doomed to it? Chapter 2.1.x. Mankind. Pardonable are human theatricalities, nay perhaps touching, like the passionate utterance of a tongue which with sincerity stammers, of a head which with insincerity babbles, having gone distracted. Yet, in comparison with unpremeditated outbursts of nature, such as an insurrection of women, how foisonless, unedifying, undelightful, like small ale palled, like an effervescence that is effervesced. Such scenes, coming of forethought, were they world great, and never so cunningly devised, are at bottom mainly pasteboard and paint. But the others are original, emitted from the great ever-living heart of nature herself, what figure they will assume is unspeakably significant. To us, therefore, let the French National Solemn League, and Federation, be the highest recorded triumph of the thespian art, triumphant surely, since the whole pit, which was of twenty-five millions, not only claps hands, but does itself spring on the boards and passionately set to playing there. And being such, be it treated as such, with sincere cursory admiration, with wonder from afar. A whole nation gone mumming deserves so much, but deserves not that loving minuteness a monadic insurrection did. Much more let prior, and as it were, rehearsal scenes of federation come and go, henceforward, as they list, and, on plains and under city walls, innumerable regimental bands blare off into the inane, without note from us. 
One scene, however, the hastiest reader will momentarily pause on, that of Anacarsis Clutes and the collective sinful posterity of Adam. For a patriot municipality has now, on the 4th of June, got its plan concocted, and got it sanctioned by National Assembly, a patriot king ascending, to whom were he even free to dissent, federative harangues, overflowing with loyalty, have doubtless a transient sweetness. There shall come deputed national guards, so many in the hundred, from each of the eighty-three departments of France. Likewise from all naval and military king's forces, shall deputed quotas come, such federation of national with royal soldier has, taking place spontaneously, been already seen and sanctioned. For the rest, it is hoped, as many as forty thousand may arrive, expenses to be borne by the deputing district, of all which let district and department take thought, and elect fit men, whom the Paris brethren will fly to meet and welcome. Now, therefore, judge if our patriot artists are busy, taking deep counsel how to make the scene worthy of a look from the universe. As many as fifteen thousand men, spade men, barrow men, stone builders, rammers, with their engineers, are at work on the Champ de Mars, hollowing it out into a natural amphitheatre, fit for such solemnity. For one may hope it will be annual and perennial, a feast of pikes, fete day peaks, notablest among the high tides of the year, in any case ought not a scenic free nation to have some permanent national amphitheatre? The Champ de Mars is getting hollowed out, and the daily talk and the nightly dream in most Parisian heads is of federation, and that only. Federate deputies are already underway. National Assembly, what with its natural work, what with hearing and answering harangues of federates, of this federation, will have enough to do. Harangue of American Committee, among whom is that faint figure of Paul Jones as with the stars dim twinkling through it, come to congratulate us on the prospect of such auspicious day. Harangue of Bastille conquerors, come to renounce any special recompense, any peculiar place at the solemnity, since the center grenadiers rather grumble. Harangue of Tennis Court Club, who enter with far-gleaming brass plate, aloft on a pole, and the tennis court oath engraved thereon, which far-gleaming brass plate they purpose to affix solemnly in the Versailles original locality, on the 20th of this month, which is the anniversary, as a deathless memorial, for some years, they will then dine, as they come back, in the Bois de Boulogne, cannot, however, do it without apprising the world. To such things does the August National Assembly ever and anon cheerfully listen, suspending its regenerative labours, and with some touch of impromptu eloquence, make friendly reply, as indeed the one has long been, for it is a gesticulating, sympathetic people, and has a heart, and wears it on its sleeve. In which circumstances, it occurred to the mind of Anacarsis Clutes that while so much was embodying itself into club or committee, and perorating applauded, there yet remained a greater and greatest, of which, if it also took body and perorated, what might not the effect be, humankind namely, the genre humain itself. In what rapt creative moment the thought rose in Anacarsis's soul, all his throes, while he went about giving shape and birth to it, how he was sneered at by cold worldlings, but did sneer again, being a man of polished sarcasm, and moved to and fro persuasive in coffeehouse and soiree, and dived down assiduous obscure in the great deep of Paris, making his thought a fact, of all this the spiritual biographies of that period say nothing. Enough that on the 19th evening of June 1790, the sun's slant rays lighted a spectacle such as our foolish little planet has not often had to show, and a Carsus Clutes entering the August Salle de Manege, with the human species at his heels. Swedes, Spaniards, Pollocks, Turks, Chaldeans, Greeks, dwellers in Mesopotamia, behold them all, they have come to claim place in the Grand Federation, having an undoubted interest in it. Our ambassador titles, said the fervid Clutes, are not written on parchment, but on the living hearts of all men. These whiskered Pollocks, long-flowing turbaned Ishmaelites, astrological Chaldeans, who stand so mute here, let them plead with you, August Senators, more eloquently than eloquence could. They are the mute representatives of their tongue-tied, befettered, heavy-laden nations, who from out of that dark bewilderment gaze wistful, amazed, with half-incredulous hope, towards you, and this your bright light of a French Federation, bright particular day star, the herald of Universal Day. We claim to stand there, as mute monuments, pathetically adumbrative of much. From bench and gallery comes repeated applause, for what August Senator but is flattered even by the very shadow of human species depending on him? From President C.I.S., who presides this remarkable fortnight, in spite of his small voice, there comes eloquent though shrill reply. Anacarsis and the Foreigners' Committee shall have place at the Federation, on condition of telling their respective peoples what they see there. In the meantime, we invite them to the honours of the sitting, honour de la séance. A long-flowing Turk, for rejoinder, bows with Eastern solemnity, and utters articulate sounds, but owing to his imperfect knowledge of the French dialect, his words are like spilt water, the thought he had in him remains conjectural to this day. 
anacarsis in mankind accept the honors of the sitting, and have forthwith, as the old newspapers still testify, the satisfaction to see several things. First in chief, on the motion of Lameth, Lafayette, St. Farjo and other patriot nobles, let the others repugn as they will, all titles of nobility, from duke to esquire, or lower, are henceforth abolished. Then, in like manner, livery servants, or rather the livery of servants. Neither, for the future, shall any man or woman, self-styled noble, be incensed, foolishly fumigated with incense, in church, as the one has been. In a word, feudalism being dead these ten months, why should our empty trappings and scutcheons survive? The very coats of arms will require to be obliterated, and yet Cassandra Murat on this and the other coach panel notices that they are but painted over, and threaten to peer through again. So that henceforth the Lafayette is but the Sir Modier, and Saint Fargeau is plain Michel Le Pelletier, and Mirabeau soon after has to say huffingly, with your Riquetti you have set Europe at cross purposes for three days. For his counthood is not indifferent to this man, which indeed the admiring people treat him with to the last. But let extreme patriotism rejoice, and chiefly Anacarsis and mankind, for now it seems to be taken for granted that one Adam is father of us all. Such was, in historical accuracy, the famed feat of Anacarsis. Thus did the most extensive of public bodies find a sort of spokesman. Whereby at least we may judge of one thing, what a humour the once sniffing mocking city of Paris and Baron Clutes had got into, when such exhibition could appear a propriety, next door to a sublimity. It is true, and we did in after times, pervert this success of Anacarsis, making him, from incidental speaker of the Foreign Nations Committee, claim to be official permanent speaker, or a tur, of the human species, which he only deserved to be, and alleging, calumniously, that his astrological Chaldeans, and the rest, were a mere French tag rag and bobtail disguise for the nonce, and, in short, sneering and fleering at him in her cold barren way, all which, however, he, the man he was, could receive on thick enough panoply, or even rebound therefrom, and also go his way. Most extensive of public bodies, we may call it, and also the most unexpected, for who could have thought to see all nations in the Tuileries riding hall? But so it is, and truly as strange things may happen when a whole people goes mumming and miming. Hast not thou thyself perchance seen Diadem Cleopatra, daughter of the Ptolemies, pleading, almost with bended knee, in unheroic tea parlour, or dimlet retail shop, to inflexible gross burgle dignitary, for leave to reign and die? being dressed for it, and moneyless, with small children, while suddenly constables have shut the thespian barn and her Antony pleaded in vain? Such visual spectra flit across this earth, if the thespian stage be rudely interfered with, but much more, when, as was said, Pitt jumps on stage, then is it verily, as in Herr Teek's drama, a fair well, of world topsy-turvied. Having seen the human species itself, to have seen the dean of the human species, cease now to be a miracle. Such doing du genre humain, eldest of men, had shown himself there, in these weeks, Jean-Claude Jacob, a born serf, deputed from his native Jura Mountains to thank the National Assembly for enfranchising them. On his bleached worn face are ploughed the furrowings of 120 years. He has heard Dim Patwa talk, of immortal grand monarch victories, of a burnt palatinate, as he toiled and moiled to make a little speck of this earth greener, of save and dragoonings, of Marlborough going to the war. Four generations have bloomed out, and loved and hated, and rustled off, he was 46 when Louis XIV died. The assembly, as one man, spontaneously rose, and did reverence to the eldest of the world, old Jean is to take seance among them, honorably, with covered head. He gazes feebly there, with his old eyes, on that new wonder scene, dreamlike to him, and uncertain, wavering amid fragments of old memories and dreams. For time is all growing unsubstantial, dreamlike, Jean's eyes and mind are weary, and about to close, and open on a far other wonder scene, which shall be real. Patriot subscription, royal pension was got for him, and he returned home glad, but in two months more he left it all, and went on his unknown way. Chapter 2.111. As in the age of gold. Meanwhile to Paris, ever going and returning, day after day, and all day long, towards that field of Mars, it becomes painfully apparent that the spade work there cannot be got done in time. There is such an area of it, 300,000 square feet, for from the Ecole Militaire, which will need to be done up in wood with balconies and galleries, westward to the gate by the river, where also shall be wood, in triumphal arches, we count same thousand yards of length, and for breadth, from this umbrageous avenue of eight rows, on the south side, to that corresponding one on the north, some thousand feet, more or less. All this to be scooped out, and wheeled up in slope along the sides, high enough, for it must be rammed down there, and shaped stairwise into as many as thirty ranges of convenient seats, firm trimmed with turf, 
covered with enduring timber, and then our huge pyramidal fatherland's altar, Hotel de la Patrie, in the center, also to be raised and stair-stepped. Force work with a vengeance, it is a world's amphitheater. There are but fifteen days good, and at this languid rate, it might take half as many weeks. What is singular too, the spademen seem to work lazily, they will not work double tides, even for offer of more wages, though their tide is but seven hours, they declare angrily that the human tabernacle requires occasional rest. Is it aristocrats secretly bribing? Aristocrats were capable of that. Only six months since, did not evidence get afloat that subterranean Paris, for we stand over quarries and catacombs, dangerously, as it were midway between heaven and the abyss, and our hollow underground, was charged with gunpowder, which should make us leap? Till a cordelier's deputation actually went to examine, and found it, carried off again. An accursed, incurable brood, all asking for passports, in these sacred days. Trouble, of rioting, chateau burning, is in the limousine and elsewhere, for they are busy. Between the best of peoples and the best of restorer kings, they would sow grudges, with what a fiend's grin would they see this federation, looked for by the universe, fail. Fail for one of spade work, however, it shall not. He that has four limbs, and a French heart, can do spade work, and will. On the 1st July Monday, scarcely has the signal cannon boomed, scarcely have the languescent mercenary 15,000 laid down their tools, and the eyes of onlookers turned sorrowfully of the still high sun, when this and the other patriot, fire in his eye, snatches barrow and mattock, and himself begins indignantly wheeling, whom scores and then hundreds follow, and soon a volunteer 15,000 are shoveling and trundling, with a heart of giants, and all in right order, with that extemporaneous adroitness of theirs, whereby such a lift has been given, worth three mercenary ones, which may end when the late twilight thickens, in triumph shouts, heard or heard of beyond Montmartre. A sympathetic population will wait, next day, with eagerness, till the tools are free. Or why wait? Spades elsewhere exist. And so now bursts forth that effulgence of Parisian enthusiasm, good-heartedness and brotherly love, such, if chroniclers are trustworthy, as was not witnessed since the age of gold. Paris, male and female, precipitates itself towards its southwest extremity, spade on shoulder. Streams of men, without order, or in order, as ranked fellow craftsmen, as natural or accidental reunions, march towards the field of Mars. Three deep these march, to the sound of string music, preceded by young girls with green boughs, and tricolor streamers, they have shouldered, soldier-wise, their shovels and picks, and with one throat are singing Syrah. Yes, pardieu Syrah, cry the passengers on the streets. All corporate guilds, and public and private bodies of citizens, from the highest to the lowest, march, the very hawkers, one finds, have ceased bawling for one day. The neighboring villages turn out, their able men come marching, to village fiddle or tambourine and triangle, under their mayor, or mayor and curate, who also walk bespaded, and in tricolor sash. As many as 150,000 workers, nay at certain seasons, as some count, 250,000, for, in the afternoon especially, what mortal but, finishing his hasty day's work, would run. A stirring city, from the time you reach the place Louis Cannes, southward over the river, by all avenues, it is one living throng. So many workers, and no mercenary mock workers, but real ones that lie freely to it, each patriot stretches himself against the stubborn glebe, hues and wheels with the whole weight that is in him. Amiable infants, amiables in fans. They do the police de l'atelier too, the guidance and governance, themselves, with that ready will of theirs, with that extemporaneous adroitness. It is a true brethren's work, all distinctions confounded, abolished, as it was in the beginning, when Adam himself delved. Long frock tonsured monks, with short skirted water carriers, with swallow tailed well frizzled and croyables of a patriot turn, dark charcoal men, meal white peruke makers, or peruke wearers, for advocate and judge are there, and all heads of districts, sober nuns sister like with flaunting nymphs of the opera, and females in common circumstances named unfortunate, the patriot rag picker, and perfumed dweller in palaces, for patriotism like new birth, and also like death, levels all. The printers have come marching, prudhommes all in paper caps with Révolution de Paris printed on them, as Camille notes, wishing that in these great days there should be a Pac des Écrivains too, or Federation of Able Editors. Beautiful to see. The snowy linen and delicate pantaloon alternates with the soiled check shirt and bushel breeches, for both have cast their coats, and under both are four limbs and a set of patriot muscles. There do they pick and shovel, or bend forward, yoked in long strings to box barrow or overloaded tumbrel, joyous, with one mind. Abbe Siais is seen pulling, wiry, vehement, if too light for draught, by the side of Bournay, who shall get kings though he be none. 
Abe Mori did not pull, but the charcoal man brought a mummer guise like him, so he had to pull in effigy. Let no August senator disdain the work, mayor by E. Generalissimo Lafayette are there, and, alas, shall be there again another day. The king himself comes to see, sky rending vive la ROI, and suddenly with shouldered spades they form a guard of honor round him. Whosoever can come comes, to work, or to look, and bless the work. Whole families have come. One whole family we see clearly, of three generations, the father picking, the mother shoveling, the young ones wheeling assiduous, old grandfather, hoary with ninety-three years, holds in his arms the youngest of all, frisky, not helpful this one, who nevertheless may tell it to his grandchildren, and how the future and the past alike looked on, and with failing or with half-formed voice, faltered their sayura. A vendor has wheeled in, on patriot truck, beverage of wine, drink not, my brothers, if ye are not dry, that your cask may last the longer, neither did any drink, but men evidently exhausted. A dapper abbe looks on, sneering. To the barrow. Cry several, whom he, lest a worse thing befall him, obeys, nevertheless one wiser patriot barrowman, arriving now, interposes his arete, setting down his own barrow, he snatches the abbe's, trundles it fast, like an infected thing, forth of the Shamdamar circuit, and discharges it there. Thus to a certain person, of some quality, or private capital, to appearance, entering hastily, flings down his coat, waistcoat and two watches, and is rushing to the thick of the work, but your watches? cries the general voice. Does one distrust his brothers? answers he, nor were the watches stolen. How beautiful is noble sentiment, like gossamer gauze, beautiful and cheap, which will stand no tear and wear. Beautiful cheap gossamer gauze, thou film shadow of a raw material of virtue, which art not woven, nor likely to be, into duty, thou art better than nothing, and also worse. Young boarding school boys, college students, shout vive la nation, and regret that they have yet only their sweat to give. What say we of boys? Beautifulest Hebes, the loveliest of Paris, in their light air robes, with ribbon girdle of tricolor, are there, shoveling and wheeling with the rest, their Hebe eyes brighter with enthusiasm, and long hair in beautiful dishevelment, hard pressed are their small fingers, but they make the patriot barrow go, and even force it to the summit of the slope, with a little tracing, which what man's arm were not too happy to lend? Then bound down with it again, and go for more, with their long locks and tricolors blown back, graceful as the rosy hours. Oh, as that evening sun fell over the Champ de Mars, and tinted with fire the thick umbrageous boscage that shelters it on this hand and on that, and struck direct on those domes and two and forty windows of the Ecole Militaire, and made them all of burnished gold, saw he on his wide zodiac road other such sight? A living garden spotted and dotted with such flowerage, all colours of the prism, the beautifulest blent friendly with the usefulest, all growing and working brother-like there, under one warm feeling, were it but for days, once and no second time. But night is sinking, these nights too, into eternity. The hastiest traveller Versailles ward is drawn bridle on the heights of Chaillot, and looked for moments over the river, reporting at Versailles what he saw, not without tears. Meanwhile, from all points of the compass, federates are arriving, fervid children of the south, who glory in their Mirabeau, considerate north-blooded mountaineers of Jura, sharp Bretons, with their Gaelic suddenness, Normans not to be overreached in bargain, all now animated with one noblest fire of patriotism whom the Paris brethren march forth to receive, with military solemnities, with fraternal embracing, and a hospitality worthy of the heroic ages. They assist at the assembly's debates, these federates, the galleries are reserved for them. They assist in the toils of the Champ de Mars, each new troop will put its hand to the spade, lift a hot of earth on the altar of the fatherland. But the flourishes of rhetoric, for it is a gesticulating people, the moral sublime of those addresses to an august assembly, to a patriot restorer. Our bread and captain of federates kneels even, in a fit of enthusiasm, and gives up his sword, he would I do a king wet-eyed. Poor Louis. These, as he said afterwards, were among the bright days of his life. Reviews also there must be, royal federate reviews, with king, queen and tricolor court looking on, at lowest, if, as is too common, it rains, our federate volunteers will file through the inner gateways, royalty standing dry. Nay there, should some stop occur, the beautifulest fingers in France may take you softly by the lapel, and, in mild flute voice, ask, Monsieur, of what province are you? Happy he who can reply, chivalrously lowering his sword's point, Madam, from the province your ancestors reigned over. He that happy provincial advocate, now provincial federate, shall be rewarded by a sun smile, and such melodious glad words addressed to a king, sire, these are your faithful arraigners. Cheerier verily, in these holidays, 
is this sky blue face with red of a national guardsman, than the dull black and gray of a provincial advocate, which in workdays one was used to. For the same thrice blessed Lorrainer shall, this evening, stand sentry at a queen's door, and feel that he could die a thousand deaths for her, then again, at the outer gate, and even a third time, she shall see him, nay he will make her do it, presenting arms with emphasis, making his musket jingle again, and in her salute there shall again be a sun smile, and that little blonde locked too hasty dolphin shall be admonished, salute then, monsieur, don't be unpolite, and therewith she, like a bright sky wanderer or planet with her little moon, issues forth peculiar. But at night, when patriot spade work is over, figure the sacred rites of hospitality. Le Pelletier Saint Fargeau, a mere private senator, but with great possessions, has daily his hundred dinner guests, the table of Generalissimo Lafayette may double that number. In lowly parlour, as in lofty saloon, the wine cup passes round, crowned by the smiles of beauty, be it of lightly tripping grisette, or of high sailing dame, for both equally have beauty, and smiles precious to the brave. Chapter 2.112. Sound and Smoke. And so now, in spite of plotting aristocrats, lazy hired spademen, and almost of destiny itself, for there has been much rain, the Champ de Mars, on the thirteenth of the month is fairly ready, trimmed, rammed, buttressed with firm masonry, and patriotism can stroll over it admiring, and as it were rehearsing, for in every head is some unutterable image of the morrow. Pray heaven there be not clouds. Nay what far worse cloud is this, of a misguided municipality that talks of admitting patriotism, to the solemnity, by tickets. Was it by tickets we were admitted to the work, and to what brought the work? Did we take the Bastille by tickets? A misguided municipality sees the error, at late midnight, rolling drums announced to patriotism starting half out of its bedclothes, that it is to be ticketless. Pull down thy nightcap therefore, and, with to me articulate grumble, significant of several things, go pacified to sleep again. Tomorrow is Wednesday morning, unforgettable among the fasti of the world. The morning comes, cold for a July 1, but such a festivity would make Greenland smile. Through every inlet of that national amphitheatre, for it is a league in circuit, cut with openings at due intervals, floods in the living throng, covers without tumult space after space. The Ecole Militaire has galleries and overvaulting canopies, where carpentry and painting have vied, for the upper authorities, triumphal arches, at the gate by the river, bear inscriptions, if weak, yet well meant, and orthodox. Far aloft, over the altar of the fatherland, on their tall crane standards of iron, swing pencil are antique castellets or pans of incense, dispensing sweet incense fumes, unless for the heathen mythology, one sees not for whom. Two hundred thousand patriotic men, and, twice as good, one hundred thousand patriotic women, all decked and glorified as one can fancy, sit waiting in this Champ de Mars. What a picture, that circle of bright-eyed life, spread up there, on its thirty-seated slope, leaning, one would say, on the thick umbrage of those avenue trees, for the stems of them are hidden by the height, and all beyond it mere greenness of summer earth, with the gleams of waters, or white sparklings of stone edifices, little circular enamel picture in the centre of such a vase, of emerald. A vase not empty, the invalide cupolas want not their population, nor the distant windmills of Montmartre, on remotest steeple and invisible village belfry, stand men with spyglasses. On the heights of Chaillot are many coloured undulating groups, round and far on, over all the circling heights that embosom Paris, it is as one more or less peopled amphitheatre, which the eye grows dim with measuring. Nay heights, as was before hinted, have cannon, and a floating battery of cannon is on the Seine. When I fails, ear shall serve, and all France properly is but one amphitheatre, for in paved town and unpaved hamlet, men walk listening, till the muffled thunder sound audible on their horizon, that they too may begin swearing and firing. But now, to streams of music, confederates enough, for they have assembled on the boulevard Saint-Antoine or thereby, and come marching through the city, with their eighty-three department banners, and blessings not loud but deep, comes National Assembly and takes seat under its canopy, comes Royalty, and takes seat on a throne beside it. And Lafayette, on white charger, is here, and all the civic functionaries, and the federates form dances, till their strictly military evolutions and maneuvers can begin. Evolutions and maneuvers. Task not the pen of mortal to describe them, true in imagination droops, declares that it is not worth while. There is wheeling and sweeping, to slow, to quick, and double quick time, Sir Modier, or Generalissimo Lafayette, for they are one and the same, and he is General of France, in the King's stead, for four and twenty hours, Sir Modier must step forth, with that sublime chivalrous gait of his, solemnly ascend the steps of the Fatherland's altar, in sight of heaven and of the scarcely breathing earth, and, under the creak of those swinging castellets, pressing his sword's point firmly there, 
pronounce the oath, to king, to law, and nation, not to mention grains with their circulating, in his own name and that of armed France. Whereat there is waving of banners and a claim sufficient. The National Assembly must swear, standing in its place, the king himself audibly. The king swears, and now be the welkin split with vivats, let citizens enfranchised embrace, each smiting heartily his palm into his fellows, and armed federates clang their arms, above all, that floating battery speak. It has spoken, to the four corners of France. From eminence to eminence, bursts the thunder, faint heard, loud repeated. What a stone, cast into what a lake, in circles that do not grow fainter. From Arras to Avignon, from Metz to Bayonne. Over Orléans and Blois it rolls, in canon recitative, plea bellows of it amid his granite mountains, pow wears the shell cradle of great Henri. At far Marseille, one can think, the ruddy evening witnesses it, over the deep blue Mediterranean waters, the castle of if ruddy tinted darts forth, from every cannon's mouth, its tongue of fire, and all the people shout, yes, France is free. O oh, glorious France that has burst out so, into universal sound and smoke, and attained, the Phrygian cap of liberty. In all towns, trees of liberty also may be planted, with or without advantage. Said we not, it is the highest stretch attained by the thespian art on this planet, or perhaps attainable? The thespian art, unfortunately, one must still call it, for behold there, on this field of Mars, the national banners, before there could be any swearing, were to be all blessed. A most proper operation, since surely without heaven's blessing bestowed, say even, audibly or inaudibly sought, no earthly banner or contrivance can prove victorious, but now the means of doing it? By what thrice divine Franklin thunder rod shall miraculous fire be drawn out of heaven, and descend gently, life-giving, with health to the souls of men? Alas, by the simplest, by two hundred shaven crowned individuals, in snow-white albs, with tricolor girdles, arranged on the steps of Fatherland's altar, and, at their head for spokesman, souls overseer Talleyrand Perigord. These shall act as miraculous thunder rod, to such length as they can. O ye deep azure heavens, and thou green all-nursing earth, ye streams ever-flowing, deciduous forests that die and are born again, continually, like the sons of men, stone mountains that die daily with every rain shower, yet are not dead and leveled for ages of ages, nor born again, it seems, but with new world explosions, and such tumultuous seething and tumbling, steam halfway to the moon, O thou unfathomable mystic all, garment and dwelling place of the unnamed, O spirit, lastly, of man, who moldest and modelest that unfathomable unnameable even as we see, is not there a miracle, that some French mortal should, we say not have believed, but pretended to imagine that he believed that Talleyrand and two hundred pieces of white calico could do it. Here, however, we are to remark with the sorrowing historians of that day, that suddenly, while Episcopus Talleyrand, long stoled, with mitre and tricolor belt, was yet but hitching up the altar steps, to do his miracle, the material heaven grew black, a north wind, moaning cold moisture, began to sing, and there descended a very deluge of rain. Sad to see. The thirty stared seats, all round our amphitheatre, get instantaneously slated with mere umbrellas, fallacious when so thick set, our antique castellets become waterpots, their incense smoke gone hissing, in a whiff of muddy vapour. Alas, instead of vivats, there is nothing now but the furious peppering and rattling. From three to four hundred thousand human individuals feel that they have a skin, happily impervious. The general sash runs water, how all military banners droop, and will not wave, but lazily flap, as if metamorphosed into painted tin banners. Worse, far worse, these hundred thousand, such is the historian's testimony, of the fairest of France. Their snowy muslins all splashed and draggled, the ostrich feather shrunk shamefully to the backbone of a feather, all caps are ruined, innermost pasteboard molten into its original pap, beauty no longer swims decorated in her garniture, like love got is hidden revealed in her paphian clouds, but struggles in disastrous imprisonment in it, for the shape was noticeable, and now only sympathetic interjections, titterings, teeings, and resolute good humour will avail. A deluge, an incessant sheet or fluid column of rain, such that our overseer's very mitre must be filled, not a mitre, but a filled and leaky fire bucket on his reverend head. Regardless of which, overseer Talleyrand performs his miracle, the blessing of Talleyrand, another than that of Jacob, is on all the 83 departmental flags of France, which wave or flap, with such thankfulness as needs. Towards three o'clock, the sun beams out again, the remaining evolutions can be transacted under bright heavens, though with decorations much damaged. On Wednesday our federation is consummated, but the festivities last out the week, and over into the next. Festivities such as no Baghdad Caliph, or Aladdin with a lamp, could have equaled. There is a jousting on the river, 
with its water somersets, splashing and ha ing Abbe Fauché, Te Deum Fauché, preaches, for his part, in the rotunda of the corn market, a harangue on Franklin, for whom the National Assembly has lately gone three days in black. The Motier and Le Pelletier tables still groan with viands, roofs ringing with patriotic toasts. On the fifth evening, which is the Christian Sabbath, there is a universal ball. Paris, out of doors and in, man, woman and child, is jigging it, to the sound of harp and four-string fiddle. The hoariest headed man will tread one other measure, under this nether moon, speechless nurslings, infants as we call them, nu pi iota alpha tau kappa nu alpha, crow in arms, and sprawl out numb plump little limbs, impatient for muscularity, they know not why. The stiffest balk bends more or less, all joists creak. Or out, on the earth's breast itself, behold the ruins of the Bastille. All lamplit, allegorically decorated, a tree of liberty sixty feet high, and Phrygian cap on it, of size enormous, under which King Arthur and his round table might have dined. In the depths of the background, is a single lugubrious lamp, rendering dim visible one of your iron cages, half buried, and some prison stones, tyranny vanishing downwards, all gone but the skirt, the rest holy lamp festoons, trees real or of pasteboard, in the similitude of a fairy grove, with this inscription, readable to runner, Ici l'on dance, dancing here. As indeed had been obscurely foreshadowed by Cagliostro prophetic quack of quacks, when he, four years ago, quitted the grim durance, to fall into a grimmer, of the Roman Inquisition, and not quit it. But, after all, what is this Bastille business to that of the Champs Elysee? Thither, to these fields well named Elysian, all feet tend. It is radiant as day with festooned lamps, little oil cups, like variegated fireflies, daintily illumine the highest leaves, trees there are all sheeted with variegated fire, shedding far a glimmer into the dubious wood. There, under the free sky, do tight limbed federates, with fairest new found sweethearts, elastic as Diana, and not of that coyness and tart humour of Diana, thread their jock and mazes, all through the ambrosial night, and hearts were touched and fired, and seldom surely had our old planet, in that huge conic shadow of hers which goes beyond the moon, and is named night, curtained such a ballroom. Oh if, according to Seneca, the very gods look down on a good man struggling with adversity, and smile, what must they think of five and twenty million and different ones victorious over it, for eight days and more? In this way, and in such ways, however, has the Feast of Pikes danced itself off, gallant federates wending homewards, towards every point of the compass, with feverish nerves, heart and head much heated, some of them, indeed, as Damp Martin's elderly respectable friend, from Strasbourg, quite burnt out with liquors, and flickering towards extinction. The Feast of Pikes has danced itself off, and become defunct, and the ghost of a feast, nothing of it now remaining but this vision in men's memory, and the place that knew it, for the slope of that Champ de Mars is crumbled to half the original height, now knowing it no more. Undoubtedly one of the memorablest national high tides. Never or hardly ever, as we said, was oath sworn with such hard effusion, emphasis and expenditure of joyance, and then it was broken irremediably within year and day. Ah, why? When the swearing of it was so heavenly joyful, bosom clasped to bosom, and five and twenty million hearts all burning together, O oh ye inexorable destinies, why? Partly because it was sworn with such overjoyance, but chiefly, indeed, for an older reason, that sin had come into the world and misery by sin. These five and twenty millions, if we will consider it, have now henceforth, with that Phrygian cap of theirs, no force over them, to bind and guide, neither in them more than heretofore, is guiding force, or rule of just living, how then, while they all go rushing at such a pace, on unknown ways, with no bridle, towards no aim, can hurly-burly unutterable fail? For verily not Federation Rose Pink is the colour of this earth and her work, not by outbursts of noble sentiment but with far other ammunition shall a man front the world. But how wise, in all cases, to husband your fire, to keep it deep down, rather, as genial radical heat. Explosions, the forcibilest, and never so well directed, are questionable, far oftenest futile, always frightfully wasteful, but think of a man, of a nation of men, spending its whole stock of fire in one artificial firework. So have we seen fond weddings, for individuals, like nations, have their high tides, celebrated with an outburst of triumph and deray, at which the elderly shook their heads. Better had a serious cheerfulness been, for the enterprise was great. Fond pair. The more triumphant ye feel, and victorious over terrestrial evil, which seems all abolished, the wider eyed will your disappointment be to find terrestrial evil still extant. And why extant? Will each of you cry, because my false mate has played the traitor, evil was abolished, I meant faithfully, and did, or would have done whereby the oversweet moon of honey changes itself into long years of vinegar, perhaps divulsive vinegar, like Hannibal's. 
Shall we say then, the French nation has led royalty, or wooed and teased poor royalty to lead her, to the hymeneal fatherland's altar, in such oversweet manner, and has, most thoughtlessly, to celebrate the nuptials with due shine and demonstration, burnt her bed?